Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Aurora. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans. Today is February 22nd, 2023. So that's two, 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 three. And I'm excited because this is level two, lesson 12. It's one of my favorite lessons. And you know, sometimes I go through some of my notes and I go through some of my things that I recorded from 10 years ago. And I take issues with myself of thinking, hmm, that's not exactly what I would say right now. And then have to make all of these current pronouncements and edit editorials and all of these different things to make things um, more in alignment with what is relevant to our journey right now. So happy to say this is one of my favorite teachings that I don't have to do too much. What is it called? Like when you tailor your clothing, like maybe you have to let it out. Maybe your gut got bigger. Maybe your boobs got bigger. You have to tailor this teaching because things changed in our bodies. Guess what? This one, I don't have to tailor this teaching so much because I did that a lot a lot, I feel like over the past two weeks. So ah, breathe a sigh of relief, everyone. And thank you for those who bore my rants and even encouraged me. Um, thank you for all of your encouragement for my authenticity, because you know, I will never sugarcoat it. So this one is one of my favorite teachings, because it literally is taking the abstract energy field pattern that I hold up here all the time, and really relating it to truthfulnesses about your journey as, as a individuated consciousness, the larger story of what is happening in consciousness itself and practicalities like this, this blah, blah, blah. I hold up this shape all the time to the point that everyone, I don't want to project upon you, but you might be like, oh, hum, oh, there's that shape again. This shape contains within it so much profound information. The way that it works when you have your inner insight, your master teacher guide of your anatomy activated, you will see a shape like this or something that is a form internally. And the knowingness simply comes from any time you attenuate or put your attention put your attention on this, you're like, oh, I'm going to learn about what is happening there. If you put your attention on this area, I'm going to learn about what is happening there. If I put my attention here, I'm going to learn about what is happening there. It is all pure direct knowing without narration. So sometimes I kind of forget about that a little bit. Wait, someone's coming into class. This is one of the most important teachers that we have over here at this university. Come on over, girl. She's going directly to her food dish which is underneath the table. Okay, so you can't see, but um, Professor Cheeky just came on it. So we're very happy to have her here. Um, I sometimes need to be reminded that instead of just holding up this shape with the expectation that all knowledge will flow to you through your direct insight, I need to describe more what is going on, what is happening, because this is a microcosm. It is, or a template, for energy and the journey of consciousness. And if you understand it on one level, like your level as an individuated human, you can then apply that to the journey of consciousness that is a star or an entire galaxy or a much, much larger time-shaped animal. So um, this just, I think you're going to love today's teaching and sharing. And I think that it's going to um, sew together or bring together many things that might have seemed like loose ends or maybe just re reminders because I always go into review reviewed this last night I joke about this like in my pajamas wearing my headphones sitting in bed for a good bed at night listening to my old recordings and when I'm listening to it I'm like wow that is profound that part is profound that part really matters so of course I send out my notes that I took last year that are my class notes and that's what I refer to when I look over here on the side so don't be distracted because I'm referring to this you can read along if you want to they're a part of what I sent out in your emails um, but let me get going so this class is called the I am God circuit and redefining death so I have I am God in quotes because I'm very clear when I talk about this in this class, I talk about how I have the I am God moment, the I am God realization, I'm God. And that none of that precludes the truthfulness of all of you having your own moment of realization when you have that culmination 
I am God. It happens for you as well. It happens for every single one of you. So my language doesn't have the smoothness to be able to get this out correctly. But basically, when you have the realization moment, I am God, it's not like I am God. This is me with attitude, like diamond rings or something like that. I am God, but not any of you, blah, 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 blah. And therefore I shall do all these different things with my diamond rings because I am God. No, the moment of I am God is a moment of culmination of your journey. That is part of your connection to the sun, the stars, and the entire neurological network that we know as the stellar network or the mind of God. And that is big that I'm going to talk all about today. And it doesn't preclude anybody else from having that same moment of truthfulness. This includes other embodied human beings in this here now place. Also other human beings who lived a long, long time ago. Also other human beings who may live in the far distant future. Also other complex organisms and levels of sentience that are, we would not define as human don't have a human face, but are out there, up there, in there, floating around somewhere. They also have this journey. I call it a journey because this is accurate. And I've talked about this in class a lot. Refinery of consciousness. They are also consciousness on its journey, being refined to the moment that you think the thought, I am God. And also, spoiler alert, so I should have said that at the beginning, spoiler alert, I'm ruining the whole show. That's the last whatever episode in this series. Um, but also, it's not the end of the show. Quote, unquote, the show of your life. I'm being very facetious in all of this. None of it is a sociopathic disassociation. It's very, very real, and it really, really matters. Um, but once you think the thought, I am God, you don't stop thinking that thought. It's not like, I am God. Um, this is orange juice on to the next thing, you know, like, it's not like that. This is my electrolyte juice here. It's not like, ho-hum, I'm God. Ho-hum, there's a tomato. Ho-hum, porcupines exist. It's like, I am God. And that realization, that culmination, that moment defines your experience going forward. It is a foundation thought and a thought that you never stop thinking. So now let me rewind a little bit and I'll relate this a little bit to Path of Light. And I'm also gonna to refer to my notes because I think that my speaking was so eloquent and so good in the class from 10 years ago and my notes on them are so good. I wanna like stay with that purity of thought. But first, let me go to share screen because you know what? We all need to brush up. I can use yellow for the color because it's the same as my sculpture, but I think it will be much less visible on your screen. So let me use like um, a, bright, a bright blue color because I think this will just be a lot easier to see. So this is that same sculpture. This, I know it's yellow over here, but I'm just going to draw it in blue. No, I draw it in yellow. Okay, guys, I'm going to draw it in yellow. Hope you can see it. So this is a cross section of that sculpture. All right, rather humpy bumpy, not very perfect drawing of circles, but we've got the vortex at the top, the vortex at the bottom. These are in air quotes as well because top and bottom lose contextual relevance when we go into higher dimensional spaces and vortex to the left and to the right, okay? You can see what I'm drawing over here. Now I'm also gonna put a giant purple dot here in the middle signifying singularity, even though you know it's a dot that's as small as my pen can make, but I wanted to emphasize it a lot. And then let's also draw, this is the membrane of death over here, what I'm drawing in black, and I'm showing it as having a thickness, all right? And now in this diagram, zoop, zoop, I'm gonna break out this diagram so that we then have a thing that shows that area blown up. So here's that same membrane of death expanded and blown up even larger, all right? And also let me reemphasize, because we haven't gone over this a lot in class that much, 
every single one of these time paths that I draw kind of like a stick with a lollipop on the end of it as your final denouement is actually a time spiral. So all of these timelines are shaped like a spiral, but look, there's one, there's the next one. You're like, Aurora, I already can't see S-H-I-T. I know, I know. That is why I don't draw them that way. Intellectually, we know that they are spirals, but for the ease of diagram, what I do is draw them as if here is the lollipop stick, and then I draw a little round dot on the end of it. And that little round dot I call the final denouement, the final moment of the movie of your life or the culmination. And it is also like the end result equation of everything that you have ever experienced. If we go to moment, uh, this bit membrane over here always represents birth, the moment zero. We can draw a little zero over here just so that you know that is the starting point and that in this lower quadrant over here, time marches in this direction. But just to confuse you and possibly anger and frustrate you, for this quadrant over here, time moves in this direction, moving from here's moment zero towards the singularity in this direction. That means that all of these time spirals are going upward like this. Got it? So basically, time it moves from the beginning. These are linear time words that we're using. Beginning is always going to be outer periphery, outer periphery, outer periphery, and time as it moves, time's arrow is always going to march forward towards the singularity, towards that eventuality, towards home. This shape that you're experiencing here, wait, let me just admit someone to the class, there we go. This shape that you're experiencing here contains a ton of deep cosmic truth. Some of the deep cosmic truth is that you're working from the general to the specific. This is what we got taught in art class a long time ago. Wait, I'll go to my face and I'll tell you what general to the specific is. So when you're an artist and you're like an oil painter, traditional materials, you work from the general to the specific. That means let's say you're going to do a painting that looks like a woman sitting in an art studio. What do you do? Do you start off with my eyebrows and my eyelashes? No. Those are the specifics. Those are the details. You put those things on last. Because if you're like, first I'm gonna paint the eyebrow and then I'm gonna paint the tiny highlight on her eye. But then you're like, wait, wait, wait. Everything needs to get moved over five inches. But you're like, but wait, that eyebrow. We, I know it was in the right spot. Now it's in the wrong spot. You're gonna have to redraw it. So moving from the general to the specific, what you would do is first paint a generalized background of what, walls that are white. Paint a generalized table area paint a generalized, what you do is you squint on your screen and you say, where is it light and where is it dark? Hey, it's lighter over here on this side of my face, it's darker on this side of my face. So what you do is you just draw an oval, some lightness here, some darkness here. You guys I'm sure have seen paintings in progress. You draw a generalized white wall over here, then you get to the details later. Down the road, after you've done a lot of work on the painting, first you've worked on your composition, the generalized placement of where all of these different items are, then making sure that their shape is correct, then making sure that here, this is foreground, midground, background. I'm giving you guys an art lesson. You're gonna be ready to be artists. All of those things have to be set. Then when all of those things are set, then when, what you do is you make sure that the eyes are drawn perfectly to capture a likeness, that you get your beauty mark in there, you get your eyebrows in there, get everything in there that are the details. And so that is what it is to move from the general to the specific, okay? You are doing the same thing as an artist experiencer, and divine co-creator, because you're doing all of this with God, you are doing that in this structure of time. The general is this area out here where the time vortex is wide. There are many, many opportunities and combinations of events here. Then you can see how it narrows down. I want to put everything down so I can really gesture with my hands here. Starts out at the bottom, moment of birth, it is a generality. There are many, many, many different things that can happen branching off from that moment. 
And the shape of the time vortex is shaped kind of like this. As you move forward in time, closer and closer to singularity, which is also your destination, it's the source that you come from and the destination you return to, your life is being focused. There are fewer and fewer timelines. So if I go back, and I'm trying not to break my sculpture here because it's a little bit delicate. If I go back to my actual drawing about this, because I'm going to draw a lot for you today, guys. This area over here, wait, first let me draw a singularity uh, timeline. This purple timeline going, this is the one that goes up the center. This is the path of least likelihood. And it is in the center of the time vortex, not merely bisecting something that is flat. All of the energy that is over here is, uh, these are different timelines, energy where you're alive. And there's many, 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 many more of them out here on the periphery than there are once we start to get inward towards the central core. That is due to this vortex shape, the way that the actual um, probability structure is, is shaped. So what this is like kind of recap for this class, oops, oops, oops. What it means is that there are many, 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 many ways to die, especially when you first came here as a little tiny infant. Um, all of these areas over here, like in this one, I just drew a short, very tiny line. Maybe you lived for one day or a week, then something happened and you died. Same thing with, you know, these are, are coming in from this. I don't just come in from the left, to the right, I, I come in from all directions, from the right to the left as well. So all of these, that might've been like, you fell off your bicycle when you were five years old, or this one might've been like, you fell down the stairs or drowned in a swimming pool. This area over here where I'm scribbling, there are many, many, many numerous timelines that are short timelines that end on the membrane of death. That is what it means to have a curve because this is, this is not merely a cone. If I made this black line here, that would be a cone and you would have a different probability structure. You get it, you would have all of this area where I'm scribbling in black as probabilities that you can experience. You don't have that. You have this amazing curved shape. And because of that curved shape, once you start to refine your consciousness and focus your journey, so you were kind of at an angle like this, then you became more at an angle like this, then you came more at an angle like this. By the time you're kind of at an angle like this and you're not that many degrees off of your central core timeline, there are not that many timelines to experience. What you're doing in your life experience is focusing your awareness away from certain levels of events or combinations of events and away from some personality characteristics. So when you're on a trajectory that hits this timeline over here, it's not just the other, the left, blah, blah, blah. Rewind and reorganize my brain. It's not just the external events. Example, you ran into a tree when you were riding your bicycle at five years old, or a nurse dropped you on your head. It's not just those things. It's also the sense of your own persona and your own characteristics and your own wisdom. You change and learn and grow as you become more and more and more in alignment with this central core timeline. You grow as a person, you grow as a soul. So this central core timeline that is purple in this color, in this diagram, I call that the path of least likelihood. Because if we look at this as a probability structure, I'm not drawing everything in the right colors, but here's the central core timeline. Here's the bullseye. It's kind of like, you know, an arrow going in there and all of these areas where I'm scribbling, which should be scribbled in yellow. These represent all of the possible timelines where you can die. And in terms of probability, it might be like 361 trillion to one, literally. There is one timeline that actually is the correct timeline for who you are and the wisdom that you accrue as an ascended master. All of the rest of the 371 trillion are not the real you. And every single one of these multiple complex branching timelines, let me choose the right color now, all of these timelines that are here that are so numerous, of course, I cannot take time to draw them during this class. 
They all represent a refinement of your definition of self, increase in your levels of wisdom and self-perception and self-empowerment. So on this little graph, outward towards the edge here, the levels of self-awareness and self-empowerment are lower. I don't know how to quantify it, but if we made like wisdom over here might be like wisdom, you know, five. And then wisdom as you go inward towards the central core timeline, that wisdom becomes a hundred or one thousand. Essentially, when you become that purple central core timeline, your wisdom should be infinity. The number there should be infinity wisdom because you have aligned with the version of yourself, the timeline and set of personality characteristics and version of yourself that is who God would be if God were born in your body in this place, in this time. So whatever is your body, if you are a Caucasian female, Caucasian male, a Black African female, Black African male, if you are from Asia, if you are from Australia, who and whatever you are, whatever is your family lineage, wherever place on the world you got born, you as a container become a container for the expression of the truthfulness of God coming through the uniqueness of your arms and your legs and your mind and your face and your cultural paradigm when you are on that purple timeline. So what happens? What is the journey? Let me just choose a red color. This is not accurate. I'm just choosing this color so you can see it on this diagram. What is the journey of consciousness? Consciousness starts out here where I'm a scribbling. That is the source. Consciousness is emitted initially out here to the periphery of your time cone, time vortex. This outlined in red is your time vortex. So you start at the periphery and then you have that initial tiny little life. You were born, you died immediately. It might've been due to the umbilical cord or some other birth trauma, but you died immediately. And then that little red dot lollipop would be your final denouement, that which contains the story, the end result of everything that you've experienced up until that moment, which might've been a very short story. You were like, I got squeezed out of the womb. I took a breath. I didn't even take a breath. I came out blue. I died. Like, you're done. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm being so facetious. Please, please don't uh, be insulted for anybody that might've uh, experienced um, infant death uh, You know, of a child. It's tragic. Death is tragic. I might be lighthearted in this class. Please do not be insulted by the way that I'm presenting this information because I'm not a, a disassociated sociopath. I'm very much in alignment with the suffering that death causes. But for right now, I'm talking about this in lighthearted terms and using diagrams. So after that little version of yourself died, yes, as a baby, you got life review. And this is of course in a pristine system, learned about what needed to be different and then re rewound to the beginning, started off here and then traveled upward again and made it maybe two days before you made it to the membrane of death and pooped out again, pooped out is just vernacular, you died again, and then circulated around again. This happens a lot, this happens a lot. Made it to the membrane of death, circulated back around. Life review, circulated back around. Up here, circulated back around. This is like, you barely even made it to age three yet. But you do notice that as you get older, you die less because of the shape of this curve over here you die less. You begin to recognize and um, accrue wisdom from all of these areas of the time field that you have explored. I wrote it beautifully in my notes. The vortex as a refinery or sieve. Only if you are in alignment with the central core persona can you exit the wormhole and reach the higher plane of existence. Um, some aspects of consciousness do not merit going on. Well, this is, wait, this is a little bit further ahead in my, in my notes than what I want to say. Um, your wisdom as you are moving towards these timelines that are in this area here gets better. You jokingly 
are able to quote unquote play the video game better. Even though we are not disassociated sociopaths, life is so much more than a video game. It is so prof profound and such a gift. But with every iteration, and iteration is a wonderful math word that means a version, like a version of the recipe. In this recipe, I used a half a cup of flour. In this recipe, in this iteration, I used a full cup of flour. In this iteration, I used 12 cups of flour, like a fine tuning of the recipe of whom you are, because this is a refinery of your consciousness and of personality characteristics. This purple timeline over here, it's not only that you've done the math perfectly, like one plus one plus two times 23 times 365 times 10 million equals, hooray, I am God. It's not just that. It is the refinement and accrued wisdom of yourself so that you get to the point where you have the I am God moment. I'm going to go further. I'm going to tell you what exactly the I am God moment is. I also want to tell you about like what is ascended mastery. All of this really relates to this beautiful painting Moe's pointing at planetary ascension, individual ascension. What is ascension? And I feel like this teaching just clarifies it all without bringing in so much muddiness as I sometimes talk about the putties and the challenges and the different you know, erroneous signals that we are facing in our world right now. This teaching is what it really all comes down to. So for me to keep going with my thought train and not, not be fragmented here, eventually you accrue more and more and more wisdom so that you are able to make better life choices and also be truer to whom, who you really are as a person. This purple line is the truest story of who you are and it's who you are as God. And when I mentioned all these different races and subgroups and everything, what I'm trying to say is whoever you are as a unique individual and however you are built, there is a version of you that is baked in it is innate in your time structure, this whole time structure that is a part of you. It is innate that there is this divine perfected version of you that is exactly who God is when God walks in your shoes. You got it? Whatever you are and or whatever type of body you have is what I was trying to say. That was what I was emphasizing instead of emphasizing some you know, anthropocentric racialism whatever type of body you have, because guess what? This entire time vortex can represent the life of a dog. There can be a dog who is an ascended master. There can be a redwood tree who is an ascended master. There can be a planet that we're on that can be an ascended master. So becoming an ascended master means that you align fully with this path of least likelihood after having explored all of these areas that are not ascension pathways, that all end in the membrane of death. And then claiming your identity or remembering yourself as God's self. And that is the I am God moment. So I'm, I have a lot more details to tell you about, but first I wanna tell you what is the I am God moment as I relate it to, remember we're talking about the human cannabinoid system and human neurology. Here I am drawing, this is a nerve. You're like, oh, I have no idea what you're drawing there. I know it looks rather bizarre. And this is another nerve. And I'm drawing it in this way, so that oriented in this way, so that you're kind of going to get the idea of what's happening. That nerve carries a signal. Here it is in yellow and I'm making it look like a squiggly line, like an electricity impulse on the nerve. The nerve impulse gets to this place that is a gap between neurons. That is known as the synapse or the synaptic gap. And it is, although very tiny to our macroscopic viewpoint, this distance for a nerve impulse is like trying to jump across the Grand Canyon. It is a chasm. It's an insurmountable space. This nerve impulse over here is like, oh, S-H-I-T, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I just ran out of sidewalk. I just ran out of options. I don't have a place to go. So what happens in our body? 
because you know that's not the end of the nerve impulse it doesn't get to the end of one nerve and be like ho hum there that's it that's the end of the story it doesn't do that what that yellow nerve impulse does is it transforms itself into these little red dots which are chemical messengers known as neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitters act as chemical messengers that help to bridge the gap between the two nerves that is known as the synapse. And then as the, the impulse jumps across this, which is definitely a quantum leap because you can't go halfway. The nerve impulse or thought impulse in your mind cannot go halfway and then just kind of hang out here. Here I am a thought like hanging out halfway. You can't just like, remember Evil Knievel, he was this motorcycle guy and he was gonna jump the Grand Canyon. Wait, let's try Evil Knievel. Here, here he is. He was not evil. It's just part of his name and he was a daredevil. Here's him on his motorcycle, all right? So there's two wheels and then here's this little guy on the motorcycle and he's trying to jump the Grand Canyon. He's gonna go, he's gotta go all the way across. He's gotta make it to the other side because there's no way to just be like, oh, like I think I'll just jump halfway and then just hang out here. That's not how you do it. It, you're not going to be successful. What would happen? You would plummet to your doom. You cannot just jump halfway. So this is a quantum leap. You must jump all the way. So the nerve impulse cannot just go halfway. It needs to get all the way to the other side. These chemical um, signals, biochemistry and neurotransmitters um, translate the nerve impulse that is closer to an electricity impulse into something that is a chemical impulse gets to the other side, and then it reassembles as a nerve impulse. Let me use the right color so I don't just make you guys upset. You're like, Roar, we won't get upset. Thank you for reassuring me that you won't get upset if I use the wrong color. Oh, the boulders are gone off of my shoulders now. Nerve impulse turns back into something that is akin to an electrical signal and continues onward on its journey on the next nerve. Please comprehend that this experience of what's happening here happens in your body a countless number of times every second. Like if you want to just do a little thought experiment with me, like everybody, like raise your right arm, wiggle your toes, that you just made this little thing happen over here of nerve impulses jumping across synapses, literally an uncountable number of times that for those signals to bounce all the way around your body. Um, that is uh, an analogy for what is happening in the mind of God. So the sun and the stars, go back to my face for a few moments. The sun and the stars are a stellar network that are part of a great brain. Every single star, so I'm pointing here at this painting, but I can also point out my window. We're having a sunny day here today, hooray. The sun that is outside of my window is like one neuron in a very, very, very great brain. And the light that is emitted from all stars or suns is analogous to the thought structures, the energy that is flowing through your brain and through your body all throughout your life that gives you a sense of self-sentience, self-awareness, you're in a contextual place, makes it possible for you to wiggle your elbows and talk and do all sorts of interesting things, all right? So the sun and the stars are neurons in a larger brain. And the whole journey that you are on in going through this process of refinery is to bring you as a cognitive participant in alignment or to the critical moment of your existence when you become part of the thought structure that is the larger overarching thought structure of this much, 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 much larger animal that it is thinking the thought, I am God. That thought is being thought or embodied by the sun, the stars, all light everywhere. This incredibly complex network of consciousness and sentience and energy that is flowing across multiple dimensions, multiple timelines, multiple versions of reality. Damn, I'm about to make your head explode, I can tell. But that is an alive being. 
If you look up at the night sky, please look at all those stars and know that they are tiny pieces. They are alive themselves. They are tiny pieces of something much, much larger that is alive. And the thing that is alive is God. And that God is thinking this thought, I am God, all right? Your whole entire journey coming here into physicality, you came away from the source. Hooray, you came away from the source. That's actually something to celebrate because there's all of this biblical baggage that's about like the bad ones who went away from God. They said, F you, God, I'm out of here. Or like, you know, some kind of a teenager like slamming the door on their parents, like, I'm getting out of here, slam the door, I'm going out on my own. That's not what it's like at all because the tendency to wish to explore is a noble, courageous, effective, appropriate characteristic. You want to have a little bit of that. If there were nothing, no, none of that characteristic available, then everything would simply always stay home, staying at the source and never going anywhere. And this tendency to want to explore or slightly go away from God is not a bad thing. It is part of the process of learning about self, accruing more wisdom, and being on the journey towards God. So your whole entire life journey of being emitted from the source, coming around here, starting out down here at this level, which is birth or the year zero, and going through all of those endless time loops and many, many, many multiple deaths until finally, in my drawing, it's purple, going up that purple line that is at the center, which you can see is kind of like in the middle of the circle, the epicenter of the circle here, and being able to rejoin with the source that emanated you, which is also your destination, that whole entire journey of your life and the multiple incarnations within one incarnation amounts to one neural impulse that is in the mind of a much, much larger animal being consciousness. And what that much, much larger animal is thinking is the thought, I am God. So back to my whiteboard drawings here, when you make this jump successfully, this is you uh, jumping, changing colors here, as a neuron, as a neural impulse, here's one level that you're jumping from and you're jumping from the next one, okay, across the synaptic gap. Here's one level that you're jumping from and here's where you're jumping to, to get across the synaptic gap. That is the entire journey of your many, many multiple lifetimes, lifespans, which could be like in the thousands of years, could be in the 10,000s of years, all of these circulations through here, all of these iterations, all of these possible combinations. You're like, oh, I lived to age 69. Then I ate that bad tuna fish sandwich and died of food poisoning. Oh, well, back to the beginning, but going to do the life review, going to do it better next time. Not going to eat that bad sandwich next time. Um, all of those um, life decisions and life choices bring you finally onto this time road, which is the time road that is the signal going across here, meeting the synaptic gap, changing form. This is very big because the synaptic gap that you have to, you can't be an electrical impulse and get across there. You got to be a chemical impulse and get across there. Same exact thing is going on with your soul, that you are a particular type of impulse. You go along over to here, you get to here, and then you have to change the, your format of what you actually are in, but that your journey doesn't end. What happens to this guy changes his format, gets across to the other side, and then keeps going, all right? So this diagram here is so beautiful and so perfect because it gives us so much information about what is ascended mastery. So the first thing is, look, everybody has this shape inside of them. Every human being, and every dog, and every cat, and every microbe, and every redwood tree use this as a logic experiment. So you're like, wow, if everybody has this shape inside of them, that means that everybody has this timeline. That is the timeline of inevitability, it's the path of least likelihood. It makes you an inevitability object. 
that re-arrives at home and remembers you are God. Everybody has that inside of themselves, including the people that humans on a human level would look at and say like, those are either madmen, crazy, insane, drug addicts, whatever is the thing that makes them like, that can't be God. Whatever thing that you look around at in this world, they're like, that guy can't be God. Um, you, what you are looking at is a peripheral version, but not their true self. In the recording, I think I used um, the mass murderer, Charles Manson, as a way of being able to say that. So even a murderer that you know killed a lot of people, this is a total psychopath, has this timeline as a potential inside of himself, but clearly has not explored that potential. All right, so here's what you know, what you can tell. Anybody that has ever died, that ever ended up over here on the membrane of death, did not successfully occupy and explore this potential here, which is the pathway of ascension where you do not die. However, just because you end up on the membrane of death does not mean you are a bad people. And in this moment, I am incredibly serious and incredibly sincere because I know that many people are dealing with grief and dealing with loss and that we care deeply about anyone in our life that might have died. So if you traveled on this timeline over here and then ended up being this red dot, then what, what that looks like on the membrane of death is here is like the final moment of a person. You should draw like a little stick figure there so that you get a sense, it's kind of like a snapshot or you know a still frame from a movie. And here's that person, the actual person their last moment, and that last moment contains the implication of this trajectory, everything that brought them up to that moment, but really also all of this accrued wisdom, everything that brought them inward from the periphery, and that there can be very good people that end up on the membrane of death. Again, to recap from last week's sharing, when you end up on the membrane of death and you are just a good person on your path that ended up exploring erroneous areas of the time field, you have your life review, kind of get dusted off by the coach, get, get you, I'm jo I joke about this, like put your mouth guard back and kind of like, you know, football, like uh, football, like you get tackled, they kind of drag you off the field. You get to the side of the field, the coach kind of looks you over, brushes you off, kind of readjusts everything. It's like, kid, like, this is what you did wrong. Don't eat that rotten sandwich. Like, okay, okay, coach, I ain't gonna eat that rotten sandwich again. Put in your mouth guard, get back out there on the field. That's what I, I joke about this. But I, again, don't want to be too lighthearted. And also life is not merely a football game. Life is much, much more profound and important on that. But I just make these lighthearted characterizations. I feel like I have to defend myself a little bit because I, people, you know, when someone dies, like it can be very fragile and how you feel about all of this. I don't want to be too silly and too lighthearted to be offensive is what I'm trying to say. But you have your life review, learn all about the things that you should have done better. And then almost everyone who is good is totally eager to get back in there, put me in coach, get back in there in the game. And then what you do is you start here at the next available you know, timeline that you haven't explored yet. And then you begin moving along that timeline, but you take with you the accrued wisdom of this whole entire experience. That's really, really, really big. Um, death is not a punishment. Good people die. Life review is not only not a punishment, it is so valuable. Life review is not done in a mean way like this, like, okay, here for your life review. Like, let me kick the SHIT out of you. I'm going to make you feel bad about yourself. It's not like that at all, actually. Life review is done like by a very, very neutral math teacher. Like, imagine them like adjusting their glasses. Clipboard is here. Ah, I see that you are here on the membrane of death. Here are all the things that you've done wrong. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, right. And then in your non ego state, you're like, oh, I really did those things wrong, but thank you for the information because now like my mind is blown. I have a totally different perspective on all these things. Let me try it again. And the let me try it again is not only like a positive response to it. This relates to what brought you into this time vortex in the first place. That you entered into this time vortex as a type of sacred commitment recognizing that there is only one doorway out of here. This is very big. When you chose or made 
life decisions to enter into physicality and experience what it is to be embedded within time. You did it with the conscious knowledge that there is only one doorway, one possible possibility or timeline or set of events that is the way that you exit this level of reality. So literally there's 10 million doorways that go to the membrane of death. None of them are how you get out of here. And the commitment is that if you want to get out of here or transcend this level of reality experience of being physical embodied matter, you must go through the refinement process. You must play the wrong notes. Let's play some wrong notes. That's a wrong note. That was also a wrong note. All wrong notes. I know I have something set up crazy on my music synthesizer this morning, but let's play some right notes. Uh, it sounds crazy. I hope it didn't hurt your ears. But anyway, the only way, the commitment that you made was to God's perfect and divine system here, which is that basically if you want to come here, why are we ascending? Because you have descended. But the descension part has so, it is fraught with many cultural isms and judgments, including the sense of, you're bad, you're wrong. You were ejected like Adam and Eve. The angel told you to go from the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve were like this, we'll go. And they sadly trudged off to bear their children in pain and to toil in the soil. I'm being a bit facetious. Um, the All of the things that tell you your consciousness fell, you have sinful nature, fall of Atlantis, fall, 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 fall from grace, all of this stuff is fraught what I'm trying to say. It's a very negative framing or contextualization of the experience of dissent. Dissent, not political dissent, but dissent as in to descend like you're a deep sea diver and you descended, you, do you dove on down here wearing your scuba gear down, down, down into the denser material world. But again, I am here in order to give you a very, very different um, viewpoint on why you did that or what happened to you instead of I'm a hapless victim, it's not fair. Or I, what, I didn't fall, I was pushed. Somebody made me come down here or any of these other things. It's like, look, came down here on an assignment. The brochure and expectations that led you to agree to this assignment have been heavily disappointing to you is not the same as your expectations. And still you made a commitment to dive here into this level of density and then do the work to realign with that central core timeline that leads to the wormhole that is the, the quantum leap, the jump across the synaptic gap and the moment in your embodied experience, when you think the thought in conjunction with the great brain in the sky, I am God. It means that literally every single decision, activity, moment, value system, self-definition, everything that you're doing as a smaller fractal microcosm fits as a perfect harmonic within the larger brain that is up there thinking, I am God, I am God, I am God. And you become like a little tiny cell, like imagine a little tiny cell on the back of my hand that one morning has that aha moment and says, I am Aurora. And it's like, yes, that is, I love you. That's right, you're a part of me. That's right, that's exactly right. A momentous occasion for this little cell that was kind of, you know, um, in, in, a, in a haze, um, in, in a state of uh, moderate confusion and ignorance, having that insight come forward to say, I'm a part of a big giant person named Aurora. And I think that thought all the time in my great brain up here, I think oh, I'm Aurora, driving my car, drinking my coffee, I'm Aurora. So when you become an ascended master and when you ascend, you have the I am God moment. It is a moment of as, as attainment. You aspire to have that moment. 
you can be an ascended master or a good term for it is ascending master. Person or organism in the process of ascension. If you have not yet had the I am God moment. Oh, say thank you, Rainbow Body. Thank you for being here and apologies if, um, if I'm not able to um, uh, speak to all of your questions in the moment, but I will do it uh, as part of the recording. Please catch the recording. Um, don't worry. Yeah, and, and I can um, talk with you as an individual later. That will be helpful. Um, but just re refocusing back on um, the I am God moment and making the commitment to, to be here in what feels like individuation and separation from God. You got it, guys, because I talk about and recontextualize from lesson 18 and the fallen ones and all of these things of those like, who would want to go away from God? Doesn't everybody love God? Don't you want to hug God? Don't you want to be close to God? Who in the world would go away from God? And the answer is something would go away from God on an exploratory mission in order to learn more about the experience of what is it like to not remember that you're God? And what is, what is the accrued wisdom that happens when you are going from the general out here in the periphery to the specific over here? So that journey of being focused from the general and then going to the specific from the periphery to the central core that is not only a refinery of choices, whether or not you ate the bad sandwich, but it is also an accruing of, or accretion of wisdom. You're accreting light in your light body. Light is information, light is information and data and intelligence and sentience. You become more wise, more filled with light, more sentient, and your personality characteristics become refined so that you become the truest nature, the truest person that you can possibly be. And again, back to the examples in our society of um, crazy psychopathic mad persons who might be on the periphery, but who have that potential for the central core timeline, they would be unrecognizable to you. They, the per a person who over here on the periphery could be, like I said, violent psychopath, bloodthirsty monster, does have as an innate potential themselves as God. What would they be like when they are God? It's almost unimaginable because they would be really, really different than the psychopathic ax murderer. But all of the events that we have over here on the periphery, sometimes what we're exploring is the wrong notes of being. What is it like to kill people? Then be like, I explored that, that was not the real me. What is it like to be a drug addict? I explored that, that was not the real me. What is it like to steal from people? I explored that, that was not the real me. Then I did this, that was not the real me. Then I explored like whatever, mutilation, that was not the real me. Um, and everybody doesn't have the same things to explore. That's true. But there is a lot of release of judgment when you recognize that you're viewing someone through their lens of experience of them, they're playing the wrong notes. Let's play some more wrong notes over here. None of that sounds like music. Those are all wrong notes. Those are all people that are in the moment of exploring wrong notes that have nothing at all to do with their self-definition of who they are as God. And key takeaway, do not mesh as beautiful harmonics with the music that is the mind of God. If, I, if I'm going to play some proper music here, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I have to do this while you're recording and waiting for me here. So wait, I'm stopping this part over here. I'm going to close it down. Now my piano will sound normal. Now I'll turn it up a little bit. This is sounding more like God getting closer. I'm not exactly there yet, but at least I'm getting closer. Oh, interesting, Trish. I'm so excited to hear that. I'll talk with you more about that too. Yeah, that Trish and Rainbow Body. I know I got to talk with lots of people. I love talking with people and thank you. Thank you for all the beautiful conversations that I have with people who are students of this class. Okay. Let me stay focused on everything from my notes because I have so much good, amazing and wonderful good stuff to share with you here. I've already been kind of riffing for an hour. Let me go to my notes. The first thing I say is, and this is deep stuff, the temporal ego fears its own demise. 
just let that sink in because there are different aspects of self. There is your core persona, the innate inevitability self that is eternal, who you are as God. And again, like when God, the abstract impulse acts through me, I'm like a woman, I have a particular face, a particular body. God is expressed in certain ways. When God as an impulse acts through each one of your unique biological architecture and unique cultural heritage, the answer flavors feeling state comes out a little bit different, but it is still the fractal, harmonic, beautiful self-expression of the music of God. That's God. That's God. That's God in your body. That's God in your body. That's God in my body. That's God in my body. That's God in my body. So, I mean, God in my body, in case you haven't noticed, like comes out as a lot of art and music, right? Everybody is unique and different though. This is different than the temporal ego. The temporal ego is not eternal. It is not the eternal central core timeline. It is not the eternal definition of who you are. So the temporal ego, temporal meaning only arising as a phenomenon from being submerged in time. It is afraid of death because it knows the party's over. I ain't going to last very long and this is the end. Um, it's not the true nature of who you are. So inside of yourself, not to be too dualistic, you do have the eternal, untarnished, gold, diamond. We use these words because gold is untarnished and diamond is so hard. The... Um, uh, untrammeled, totally pure and pristine, real version of you, who you really are. Then you have all of these other versions of you, some of whom are not wise, some of whom are merely ignorant, some of whom are extremely psychopathic, meaning they have diseases that need, they need to be healed from or are exploring what self state would be like in an extremely distorted reality, but they are not the true self and they are your temporal ego. And then also some of them are just the temporary of who you are because you're wearing it because it's an outfit that's in style, but it's not eternal style. So in eternal outfit, like up the central core timeline, I'm just going to be very silly and lighthearted here, but that would be like one of those, you know, little black dress, right? But this, I don't know if this males will relate to this um, analogy. But that's the little black dress that goes with everything. Like you just wear a different scarf or a different set of shoes. You wear it, it works with everything. Um, Everybody is supposed to have a little black dress in their closet. But uh, the rest, everything else that you've got as your ego state, these are like um, things that are fashionable just for the moment. That was in style, but it's not in style anymore. That was in style, but it's not in style anymore. The real profundity is how does the ego feel about itself if it looks at itself and it's like i am not an eternal being i am only here as a flash in the pan i'm not going to be here forever what does the ego think and do and feel in response to that level of self perception and self-reflection self-awareness the ego says this ah, i'm afraid or sometimes it's kind of a little kid it's like I'm afraid. I don't want to die. I'm, you know, you know, I don't know what to do with all of this. Um, yeah, the temporal ego fears its own demise, it fears its own unmaking, but it is always a temporary construct just for, it is necessary for navigation in the world. Um, but your eternal ego does not fear death because it is eternal. Your eternal ego is what I was speaking about last week at how experts do star travel. When you go through a stellar portal, again, you are not doing star travel like a clank clank metal spaceship. You have had to refine your sense of self and hone your ego and become the right shape to go through the frequency door. And that's in my song. I wanna say, go through the frequency door, 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 door. Um, when you go through the frequency door, it's because you are the right shape. Like let's say your body has to be shaped, you know, like this, then you can fit through the frequency door. But let's say that your ego up until this point um, has been shaped like this. And it's like, oh, it doesn't go through. It's a key, a key does not fit in the lock if it is not the right shape. That is the most neutral way of comprehending all that is going on here. It moves beyond judgment. 
It moves beyond anthropocentrism and ethnocentrism of what are the merit, merits, what are the requirements for something to get through the door, essentially to go into heaven. A lot of people would be like, ah, you must always do this. You must never do this. You must always eat goats. You must never eat pigs. Then you will go into heaven. And someone else would be like, no, 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 you can't go into heaven eating either goats or pigs. You must eat nothing but um, uh, avocados. And then someone else would say, no, 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 no. You can't get into heaven doing any of those things. What you have to do is uh, perform these prostrations and say these magical incantations. And then you will get into heaven. Like you get it, like I'm talking about human religion, dietary restrictions, all these things that are about the definition of what it takes to get into heaven. And the real answer is what does it take to ascend is a unique journey for every single person. Because where you were born on this planet is unique. Your physical, biological architecture and DNA is unique. Your life circumstances are unique. And that the song of you in order to be able to go into heaven, you must sing a unique song of you. It can't be an imitation of someone else's music because that was them being the right shape, but you've got to be the right shape for you. So we move out of the age of Pisces where it says, follow this recipe. You will be a good person. You will go to heaven. And into the age of Aquarius where we say, follow your inner directive that will tell you exactly what you need to do with your arms and legs, with the person that you are in this world in order to be this um, ascended master or essentially a fractal microcosm of God embodied in this world. So the temporal ego is afraid. It's afraid to die. It's afraid to face the music. It knows that there's going to be an end to all of this, but your true self state that is eternal is not afraid at all. Even though we do not dispose or discard of life because we honor life so much, we're always trying to be alive, but we, the true aspect of self, we are not afraid. And we are in alignment with this knowing that states there is an inevitability to this journey. Again, we don't discard guard lives. So there's a movie that I refer to in my notes and also often in this class. It's Groundhog's Day with Bill Murray. Very comedic, very deep, very profound, good movie about, you know, karma, cause and effect, causality, very positive, where basically one human being is endlessly stuck repeating the events of one day until they refine their consciousness, become less of a bad person, I would say. I could come up with a lot of vernacular words, but he did not treat women well. He did not treat homeless people well. He was incredibly self-centered and narcissistic and took his body, didn't, didn't care for his body or do anything good for anyone else. He needed to figure out the exact right music for to get out of Groundhog's Day and not repeat the same mistakes all the time. So in that movie, he had to go through a learning curve of accruing wisdom. He repeated the same day over and over and over. And at a certain point, he learned to play the piano, give things to homeless people, serve the community, be kind to the woman he loves, even love himself. And then he kind of broke the spell and was able to uh, transcend the repetitive negative time loops. Um, but that is exactly, it's a beautiful, you know, comedic truthfulness of what we are experiencing. But in that movie, at a certain point, he reaches what is known as existential dread. When a person is in just an endless repeating time loop and they wake up and they're like, oh, this again, I can't take it. He just like jumps off a building. It's like 901, he gets up, jumps off a building, tries to kill himself in all these different ways. We do not throw our lives out the window, all right? That's what I'm trying to say. Although you might at times experience existential dread where you're like, another time loop. Oh, I don't know if I could take it anymore because I know you've been through the ringer, been through the wash cycle many times to the point of being threadbare. But we don't throw our lives out the window, meaning that's it. Like, I know uh, I'm going to get another life again. I'll just jump off a building, just stand in front of a truck, any of these things, get me out of here. This, this, I, the cosmic, dear cosmic complaints department, I don't like life. Sincerely, gonna kill myself now, jumping out of window. And again, like this, I'm being incredibly lighthearted and just very flimsy. Suicide is devastating. And if you're a person that's a survivor, like if someone has uh, in your family has killed themselves and you're a survivor of that, I'm totally in compassion with you. If you have attempted suicide yourself, I'm totally in compassion to you as well. I make these presentations lighthearted 
but I recognize the topic of death, the topic of such profound existential distress that a person would try to destroy themselves, the topic of profound suffering and pain to the point of suicidal tendencies and self-destruction. Like these are deep, deep things that I, I want you to know. I'm never making fun of you. I'm totally with you. I'm an encourager of you on your journey, but I will also tell you with so much gentleness and so much compassion and goodness that death is not the exit is not the exit, you just circulate back around. So just like that lighthearted comedic movie, he jumped off a building and then woke up in the morning in his pajamas, starting at the beginning again. That is exactly what happens to us. That anything that brings us to this area over here that is the membrane of death, that does not bring us to the doorway, which is the wormhole, which is the synaptic gap where we remember that we're God and we jump to the next level of experience, Anything that's not that means that you're just going to have to circulate again. So a lot of people have explored self-destruction. A lot of people have explored giving up. A lot of people have explored substance abuse. There is no judgment on you on all of these things. Let me play on my piano. It's like, here's a wrong note. Wrong note. Wrong note. Wrong note. Wrong. No, 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 no. These are just all wrong notes in your life. And really the gift, the divine gift is that you're, you're given the opportunity to play wrong notes and then get your life review. Like you die, get your life review, wrong notes. Cause I, I show it as a math teacher, but it could be a music teacher where you're like, wrong notes. Don't take it personally. I'm not here to make you feel bad about yourself, but I'm here to give you this crucial information so that you can play right notes. And really our life embodiment is meant to be something super joyful where you're like, hooray, I'm alive. I can't wait to play some notes today. I can't wait to go in the right direction. Look at how my back went up. I'm so excited and playing the right notes. And then when you make a wrong note, you're not, you're not like, oh no, I'm going to die. There will be endless you know, misery and torture. No, not at all but there will be a learning experience. So here's the attitude that I wish for each one of us to embody. Ascension is baked into who you are. It is the primacy of your existence. You are an inevitability object. It has already happened for you. It will happen for you. It can't be avoided. It's a basic part of who you are, but that doesn't mean you ever throw your life or anyone else's life out the window. Cause I wouldn't want anyone to be like, you mean I get endless lives and I can kill myself and I can kill others. And it's like, no, 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 that is not it. That's not it. So I always say that Breakfast of Champions this is a book from Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut was a great writer. He's not on earth anymore but he wrote this book called Breakfast of Champions that's worth the delve because this guy reads a science fiction manual. Like he finds it in a bar, he reads it and it says in there something like, um, dear reader, if you are reading this, you are the only alive person, last alive person left on earth. Everyone else has been turned into a cyborg or automaton. And the guy reads this and then he puts down the book and then he gets his G-U-N and he starts a shooting. And I always say to everybody, please do not, Dwayne Hubler, please do not breakfast of champions. Like if you get the message, like you're the only alive person in the world, or you're the only like, please, please do not use this for profound self-destruction or destruction of others. That's not what this is about at all. So the journey towards God, God is not a psychopath. So as you are on your journey of remembering and recognizing that you're God, and you're like, well, wait a minute, if I'm God, does it mean that I can just get a G-U-N and just destroy everything? Like, no, that's, that's not a God response. You know what is a God response as you are on this journey of self-remembering? You know, I'm kind of getting the feeling that I'm God. Maybe I'm God. It means I, I think I care about everyone. I think I care about everyone and I care about everything. I also feel kind of responsible for everything. Like I'm creating all of this. And also I wanna make this all better for everyone. Why in the world would I want to destroy my creation, destroy occupants or creatures within my creation or to be cruel or take from them in some way? I wouldn't. As God, what you're really having this realization of is the pro profound power of creation and the responsibility to that which you create. And that's also really, spoiler alert, part of why you made that choice and that commitment to come here into the creation. 
look, you're not getting out of here until you get shaped right. Look, kid, you're not getting out of here until you get shaped right. Shape up. And the process of shaping up is really being like, okay, like I'm God. I created all this stuff. There's tons of stuff that's painful. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of imbalances. How do I respond to this? That's part of perfect music that you're going to learn to play so that you can get on the wormhole and get out of here one day. But everybody does this. Lots of amazing things happen because now I'm going to drop for you as a picture. Sometimes I lose my cursor on the uh, screen. Gonna draw it for you on a picture because what I did was I drew for you one version of what the Ascended Master timeline is. Here's one version. Starting at birth over here, zoop, up to the central core timeline there. But that, wait, 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 let me rewind in order to make things a little bit more sensible here. All right, I'm gonna choose a color. The color is going to be the color of Ascended Mastery. This is, let's draw it better. In case you can't tell, I'm a perfectionist. This Ascended Master in green started at that green line and traveled up here, perfectly playing every note and made it back to the source. But guess what? So did this one over here. So did this one over here. So did this one over here. Every single one of these ascended masters has a pathway of least likelihood that joins with or vectors to the epicenter of consciousness emission that we know as the source or singularity, which is also the definition. So according to this, if I drew this really accurately, it would look like a dandelion seed head. You got it? The dandelion seed head where there's a, an amazing array of all of these little spokes that are coming out in every direction. Basically, every single one of those spokes represents one person or creature who has become an ascended master. The number of those who have already become ascended masters up until this point, 3.13 p.m., February 22nd, 2023, is uncountable. It's more than the number of grains of sand on one particular beach. That is how many ascended masters have ascended. And I'm only talking about the humans. There are ascended master mice. There are ascended master microbes. There, I've already talked about ascended master flowers or blades of grass or trees. In fact, Every single organism has this potential baked into it, the necessity of the return of their consciousness to that which emanated it. It is called this teaching, the I am God circuit, because in a circuit, I don't know if you can see this, it's in white, you're coming away from the thing and then going back to the thing and coming back up. You couldn't see that at all. Let me draw it again. Boom. Draw it again. Coming away in a circuit, you come away from the source and then you go back to the source. It's a big giant loop, a big giant loop. It is a circuit. So this is about the I am God circuit. And an almost countless number of other individuals other than you has made that journey successfully. And that means that they are like, this nerve impulse, go and go and go and go and go in, having to change into a chemical impulse, jump across the Grand Canyon, and then keep going. And so wait, where are all of these ascended masters? They're all over here, where I made that big circle. They're in the next neuron. The next neuron would be like the next level of reality. They have ascended. So wait, I love my notes from this class so much, this particular lesson. Let me read my notes so that I don't skip them because they're so good. They're so tasty. Oh, so wonderful. Beautiful, Trish. I'll talk with you about it and, and love you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, the ego that I talk about that is temporal exists here at the solar plexus, which we know as the yellow chakra, which I've spoken in this class at length about being a hacked 
operating system, the hacked human OS. Not created by humans, not created for humans or their ease of use, and something that we very much are reclaiming and um, unhacking for ourselves. And that's what the ascension process is for us. The path of okay, ego at the level of yellow is aware that it only exists due to consciousness being submerged in time. It's like, this is the version of me that only exists because I'm here in time. And it fears what's going to happen. What's going to happen to me when I'm not swimming around in time anymore? You got it? So the temporal ego that is afraid to unexist is the ego that is defined by who's your job? Who do you work for? How much money do you have in the bank? Whose mother or father are you? Or who is your mother or your father? Because people are often defined by their familial heritages. Like, I'm a part of this family. It's your family name. Are you starting to get there, guys? What's your family name? That's part of the definition of who you are. And then when you get to the core persona of who you are, you're not defined by your family name. People are like, oh, not defined by my family name, but my family, my people, my this, my that. I know my this, my that. My this, my that. That's your ego. I'm not making fun of your ego because like, I'm a little bit different because I'm a walk-in. So I don't necessarily have that same sense of like my family name because my family name is literally Aurora and I'm, and I'm you know, I'm, I'm not going to lose my family name because my journey is a little bit different because I, I know who and what I am, even as I've made a commitment to come in here. So my journey is a little bit different, but I don't want to um, cause confusion by the way that I talk about these things. But for most people, they're defining themselves based upon their biological lineage, their familial heritage, even to the point of family name, whatever is each one of you has a, a family name. Marie's last name is Redmond. And so in this temporal level of reality, she, her ego defines herself as a Redmond even though I don't want to single you out by putting the spotlight on you, but um, whatever are your guys' last names, that's a part of the temporal ego. Because when you are an ascended master, that will not be your definition of who you are. You get it? So the path of least likelihood is that purple pathway in the time diagram, the pathway of ascended mastery, the central core timeline. And we experience this big, 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 listen here, listen now. We experience this when all of our chakras are in perfect alignment with divinity or higher consciousness or the overarching entity within which we exist. There was a time in the brochure when everybody who was born had perfectly aligned chakras. Wait, give you a picture. Here's a picture and then I'll go back to what I'm talking about here. This is a picture of a person with perfectly aligned chakras. I use this in this class all the time. Dun, dun, dun. That's why I draw this. I draw people that are perfectly aligned chakra people for a reason. Like I'm drawing the perfect anatomy. And so this is the, def the, the anatomy. These are the chakras and the way they would be shaped and arranged of a person who is an ascended master or an ascending master. All of their chakras are in perfect alignment. No wibbly wobbliness, nothing to the side. If this is your impulse of who you are, it's all going straight up and down. None of it is going slightly at an angle to the side where it's gonna bump into the membrane of death, all right? All right. Um, your own thoughts and behaviors are perfectly in alignment with this entity God. So when you look like that picture I just showed you, when your um, core timeline is perfectly aligned up and down like this, read it again. All of your thoughts and behaviors are perfectly in alignment with this entity that is known as God. Think about that, guys. What if every single one of your thoughts and behaviors and everything that you did was totally in alignment with God, God living and acting through you? Everything. What if every single thing you said was perfect and divine and every single thing that you did was perfect and divine and every single way about the way that you metabolized your whatever walnuts that you ate for breakfast is perfectly divine. That is what it is to be on that central core timeline. Each ego is like a recipe that is made up of constituent elements. This is really good. So we're talking now about both your temporal ego and your ego as an ascended master. Your ego is made up of re your recipe. Your recipe is made up of certain characteristics, like a dash of this, 
a dash of this and a cup of this, right? So you can tell them what's my ego made up of a lot of creativity. I'm going to start with a cup for it to make Aurora. We're going to start off with a cup of creativity. And then we're going to put in a, a you know, tablespoon of tenacity. And then we're going to put in a whatever um, eyedropper full of compassion. You got it. Like these are the um, personality characteristics that make me who I am. But more to the point, the question is, who is living through your genes? Because your ego is a representation of the recipe of who you are in experienced embodiment form, but it is absolutely related to your DNA and your DNA behavior. Your DNA is like a antenna and a receiver of light and of information and of characteristics and of consciousnesses. Your ego can also be defined as who are you picking up on your antenna, your TV station or radio station of reality broadcasts? Those entities, consciousnesses, and characteristics are who are acting through you. So there really is something to the sense of psychopathic mad persons who are like, um, you know, violent, violent, violent. And then like, you know, the, the demon jumps out of them. And then they're like, it wasn't me. Someone else made me do it. It's not my fault. Um, Cause there's a lot of that. But of course, like you have to take responsibility for what you do with your arms and your legs. Even if something tries to come in and take over, this is very, very, very big stuff. You can't let someone else drive your car. Anybody who actually does own a firearm and is a uh, responsible user of firearms and weapons knows that you must keep your firearm locked at all times, make certain that it cannot fall into someone else's hands, and that if your firearm is used to, to kill someone or commit a crime, you are culpable for it, both legally and morally. You are a part of what made that crime able to happen. So you must safeguard your body. You must safeguard your DNA so that it cannot be hijacked, taken, stolen, and occupied and misappropriated by um, consciousnesses that you would never invite in or never wish to be a part of DNA. And also, these are some of the guys that smashed their guitars on stage. They're not in DNA for a reason. Like you guys have a body for a reason. You passed the audition. You're on this process of wisdom accrual. Those who have already died, they're like, did something really, really, really wrong. And they should not be running around trying to influence time and reality. They should be getting a life review and getting their own act together. That's the big thing that I want to say in this particular class with a little bit of attitude too. If something is dead and it's on the membrane of death and it's talking to you and it's purporting to give information, guidance, uplift, or some kind of whatever influence to you when you're alive, you're actually much more qualified at guiding yourself and being alive than they are. Just ask it like, did, do you play the right notes? Have attitude. Uh, uh, pardon me. Did you play the right notes? No, you played the wrong notes and you ended up on the membrane of death. And therefore you should not be talking to me, telling me how to not, you know, how to play the right notes and not go on the membrane of death. Like you can only teach what you know. If these things played the wrong notes and they ended up on the membrane of death, they only know the wrong notes. They don't know the real notes. If you want to have guidance, information, or assistance, you get guidance, information, assistance from the ascended masters. And the ascended masters have ascended and lived over a countless millennia. There's a lot of them out there, is what I'm trying to say. So you do not want mentorship from the membrane of death. They will only mentor you to die. But you do want mentorship from the eternal characteristics of the entities that are known as the mind of God that they have successfully transcended this level of reality, this level of densification. They have gone through the wormhole and they now exist as neural impulses on that next stage of experience. And they are absolutely pristine, positive, good influencers, things that you would want to um, have as allies in your journey of spiritual attainment, but not the guys that are dead on the membrane of death. So this speaks again to the question in my notes, who is living through your genes? So with your genes, the antenna of your DNA, you're picking up on various different channels, quote unquote, spiritual or consciousness-based channels. And there is an amalgamation of various entities that are speaking to you and through you via the genetic antenna. DNA as a bridge between the world of pure light and the world of experienced reality. I talk about that a lot. 
So your energy field is the field of possibilities that surrounds you of your life. And similarly, your DNA is the energy field that represents the field of possibilities of whom you can be. All right. This vortex is a refinery or a sieve. And only if you're in alignment with the central core persona, can you exit the wormhole and reach the higher plane of existence. Some aspects of consciousness do not merit going on. The final moments of the distorted version of self, that's this over here, get to my drawing. Because I did this expanded uh, little thing over here for a reason. You know what I'm talking about? Wait, 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 wait. No, I don't want that. I'm pressing buttons, guys. I'm sorry. I did this expanded version of the membrane of death over here so that we could kind of get a view of what is happening there. Divergent um, personnel, okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. The final moments of the distorted version of self. So this represents a final moment over here. This guy, for whatever reason, ended up dead. And that in this description that I'm giving to you here, it's not about good or bad or about merit, merit a meritocracy. It is about a key fitting in a keyhole, uh, like topological, meaning the study of this, the surface of shapes, a topologically determined feature must be the right shape to go through the frequency door. So let's say uh, this area over here where I'm scribbling is the area of freedom. And you're like, oh, great. I'm just going to go through the frequency door and go directly into that area of freedom. And the only problem is you are not shaped correctly, that there is something about the temporal ego, that there is something about this guy over here that might have just energetically, we're going to draw like weird shapes all around them, that as they are getting to this level of the membrane, the membrane says, sorry, you're not the right shape. You can't get through there. And that's what this is really all about, being the right shape. And this is the analogy of the sun bark of Ra from ancient Egypt and crossing the Duat and creating your own floating raft of consciousness where you must be shaped in exactly the right way in order to be able to go across the ocean of consciousness and join with the solar disk, which is the sun bark of Ra, the great raft of uh, the gods and the divine ones that then takes you across the this journey endless journey of the afterlife you got to be shaped in the right way it is not about um just paying someone off or being cool or having a lot of likes on instagram you literally have to be shaped your energy body and your thought structures and your belief systems shaped in the right way divergent personality characteristics or versions of self can be very divergent from the central core persona. So what that means is the purple persona, the central core timeline, who we are as an ascended master, that version of who you are might be totally unrecognizable to you when you're in the mad person, pathology, substance abuse, addict, insanity version of reality. And, you know, I think that Groundhog's Day movie is a very compassionate movie because it really shows this guy who started out with like he had a lot to learn. He was very ignorant and self-serving, but then he really went through a torture by doing these things so many times over and over and over again. He was really tortured and then fell into despair and then fell into violence and self-destruction and self-violence and all these things. I think that you can really look at a lot of people in our world through that lens of compassion. That, that when you see a shambling drug addict, you see a version of a person living their life that is not their ascended master life, that is not their truest version of self, but they might be in those levels of completely giving up existential despair, self-abandonment. When they abandon themselves, it is not that God has abandoned them, but in a lot of ways, they have abandoned themselves. They're like, F it all. Like, they don't care. Like, give me anything. Uppers, downers, sidewaysers, give me everything. I don't want to exist. Get it? So people do a lot to check out. I feel like I want to say this to you. So like, have compassion for those that we see that are at that level of um, despair in their journey. 
Um, but none of this means like um, enable their behavior because I don't want you to get like drain your bank account, give it all to a heroin addict. No, because that doesn't help them in their life. Um, but every single person that gets to those levels of despair, they have to push on through. They have to get through it and get to the point of finding meaning again or creating meaning for themselves in their life and climbing back or creating the pathway to becoming the person that they were always meant to be. So I use shambling drug addicts as an example of that, but also psychopathic killers people who are very, very distressed in their lives, who might take a gun and you know shoot a lot of people, or even people that are part of organized state-sponsored violence that we know as the military, truly. And this might hit home because some people might be like, hey, my mom or my dad was in the Marines. I'm in the Marines. I'm a military person, You know, honor my journey and all these different things. And I'm like, look, you're going to get to the point of being an ascended master. You're going to look at not only the identification with the Marines and the armed forces and all of that as strictly temporal ego stuff, but the activities of professional state-sponsored violence as being not in alignment with being an ascended master. I'm sorry, that's just going to happen. But when you look at people on that pathway, you just recognize like they're playing those notes of the song. It's not a song yet. They aren't there yet, but they're going to get there, but they're going to get there. I want to read more of my notes, but before I do that, I want to talk about the shadow because I, last week, I wait before I go to the whiteboard. Last week I ranted, I raved, I raged against the machine because I'm like, I really don't like new age shadow work in the way that a lot of people are doing this. And my criticism stands. My lesson from 10 years ago when I talk about this is what is shadow and what is the shadow of an ascended master? So if I hold up a thing, perfect. Here's a crystal that represents an ascended master. Light falls upon this crystal. It is a material object that has density to it. And it means that there's this area over here where there will be a shadow, an area of non-light. That because there's this accumulation and concentration of light here, there is by definition, the non journey of light to this area here, areas of darkness or ignorance, which is the pristine definition of what shadow is. When we talk about the putis, that poop that is smeared on the membrane of death, we talk about it in lighthearted and accurate terms, the aspects of self that are negative personality characteristics that made it to the membrane of death. Oops, they realized they did something wrong. If it's you or I, we're like, sorry, my mistake. Put me in again, coach. Let me try it again. If it's one of these putis, they're like, hi. We have been trying to artificially extend our journey instead of living eternally as an ascended master within the mind of God. We've been trying to do stuff that is so bad, so wrong, so harmful, and identify with our pain so assiduously that we never dissolve and never get resolved from the membrane of death and we're staying there. Like those are the guys that like set up the encampments in your hallways so you cannot actually get past them like par pardon me pardon me i just like to get past like no get out of here honey this this ain't this isn't this isn't your part of town i'm like actually you're in my house it is my part of town and you don't belong here because i already read this part for you in the notes when your chakras are in alignment that is when you are part of the mind of god when your chakras have stuff that is smeared on the membrane of death that refuses to be resolved that is what destabilizes these chakras. Those guys that are the homeless encampment that refuses, that continually identifies with this pain, refuses to be healed and refuses to go off of the membrane of death and stop destabilizing your chakras. That's the thing that is preventing you from being God. It's deep stuff, deep stuff. Those putis aren't just on their own journey where you can be like, oh, well, you're a train wreck, but you're doing your thing. They are absolutely a train wreck, but they're a train wreck on the membrane of death in your chakras, in your body, affecting your DNA, affecting your divine connection, affecting your divine realization. So really this journey of being an ascended master has everything to do with being like, hmm, I'm God. I came here into my creation. I it came into this denser level of realm. I felt what it was to have a body. I felt what it was to have chakra systems. I felt what it was to have a bunch of 
unresolved, traumatized ego pain signals blocking up the membrane of death and inhibiting the flow of energy in the chakra system. And now I have to figure out some effective response to it. As a brief aside, how is energy supposed to flow around here when there's no membrane of death putis preventing it from going? What's supposed to happen is emerging from the central core timeline here, flowing around in a figure eight like this, back to the central you know, source, which is a doorway to infinity, and then you pop out into a new dimension and flow around in a circle. Doorway to infinity, pop out in a new dimension, flow around in a circle. Doorway to infinity, pop out in a new dimension, flow around in a circle. And that while you're doing all of that lateral figure eight, like a figure eight lying on its side, you also have spiraling going in like this, spiraling going up like this, spiraling inward from the sides like this, spiraling inward from the sides like this. And that is literally the beautiful functionality and healthful state of God when all of those time patterns are being expressed and there's nothing inhibiting it or impeding it. So there have been larger level diseases at the level of time itself, at the level of God consciousness, at the level of consciousness flowing on its journey into and out of existence or into embodiment and out of embodiment existence, that there have been many, many things slowing down and that a part of your journey coming here, self-recognition, remembrance of God, externalization of your internal states, so that you can see your creation, and then da, 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 how do you respond to it? How do you respond? You're like, there sure is a lot of poop around here. What do I do? Bucket and a mop. You're going to have to do something to respond to this. So the divergent personality characteristics or versions of self can be very divergent from the central um, core persona and have different uh, qualities than who you really are. Huge, huge, huge distortions. I used as the example, like history's worst madman or mad person like Hitler would be refined on this journey would become almost unrecognizable as the improved version of self. You might meet Hitler in heaven, but he's not going to look resemble at all the one that we know version of humanity that we know from this particular historical perspective as a genocidal crazy person. All right, got it. And I feel comfortable using those words, talking about who he was in this particular world. But there is a version where he became refined and acted differently. And you know that he had, I'm not an apologist here, but you know that he had different potentials inside of him. Like he had the potential to be an artist. He wanted to go to art school. He wanted to do a bunch of different things. Charles Manson had the potential to be a musician. He wanted to be like a 1960s folk singer. Like these things didn't happen for these people, but they had those potentials. Their life could have gone in a radically different direction. Not an apologist, but a recognizer of the potentials of what is going on um, in these different um, negative, very negative peripheral selves. Um, so big, big, big. Um, consciousness is always on a journey of evolution through this chakra shape. This is what consciousness is doing. Consciousness is evolving. And when you meet someone, they're still in the process of evolving. This is true of all of us. Everybody that you meet when you walk around during your day and yourself as well, please recognize with utmost compassion, you are in the process of evolving. The peripheral selves are not as evolved as they will be on the central timeline. And there are many different ascended master timelines that all converge at the infinity point like a seed head of a dandelion. I just showed you that in that drawing. Some areas of life are just the self figuring things out or wrong notes on the piano, self-exploration. And that's kind of like, um, I don't know if you ever went through this in your life. Like, did you ever go through a punk phase, an emo phase? you know, like black mascara or wearing a mohawk or something like that. If you say yes, you can share pictures. I'm joking. But some of that is self figuring self out. But that is part of the journey of being an adolescent on the journey towards adulthood and maturity. You're like, I'm gonna try this out. I'm gonna wear this outfit. I'm gonna wear this persona. I'm gonna see if it's me. Then at a certain point, you're like, it's not really the real me, but this, this is the real me. Or maybe you're like, I am 1% punk or emo, but then I'm also all this other stuff on, on top of that too. 
So some areas of life are where you're just figuring things out and you work your way up until you reach the ascended master persona. The ascended master persona is your eternal persona. And when you start to really, this is deep stuff and really sincere stuff that I share with you now, when you start to really feel and experience that in your life, you become unshakable. Like your foundation becomes very, very strong and truthful. And you are not defined as a sense of self in response to how others look at you or what external circumstances are going on or anything external. Like you know who you are on a very, very deep level. And there is an amazing sense of solidity in like, oops, sorry, in like, like look, like, or not non-negotiation, just non-negotiation. Like, look, like, like my favorite color is red. Like, that's it. That's it. That's just what it is. I don't need to have a whole conversation about it. I just know what it is. Um, this is also very big. Um, so all core personas point to the central point of consciousness, which is unity consciousness, comprised of all these individual elements at the center of the dandelion seed head. This is the experience of all of these individuated people that have been refined to their truest definition of self that all converge at the center, at the center, and at that center, that is unity consciousness. And even dolphins converge at the center and microbes there's a lot of life there. There's blades of grass that live there. All core, okay, each ascended master has its own unique characteristics uh, and trajectory of a vector through time. So of course, a, the journey of a blade of grass is unique to it and the journey of a human is different or a dolphin is different, although there are very many parallels, but even amidst humans, every human has its own unique characteristics and its own unique trajectory or vector through time to be able to get to that culmination moment where you're like, ah, I am God. And experiencers of the third dimension who experience different things, but come to the same conclusion. This is it. You're all experiencing a unique story. You're all on a unique path. The path all leads to the same place, which is that moment. I am God. This is the I am God circuit. It's coming from the source. This is the source right here. Go away from the source. Assemble over here as an ego, a physical form. Live in the third dimension. That's the red chakra zone, like having a physical somatic cellular body and being dense and then circulating back to the source, completing our journey. It's analogous to the journey of a neuron, in, neuron within your neurology, I'm already got that for you. And in your brain, you have nerves that make an impulse flow from nerve to nerve, jumping across the synaptic gap and the energy impulse goes across by becoming a neurotransmitter and then continues on its journey. I already got all of that. These time structures are analogous to little neural impulse trying to jump across the synaptic gap from one nerve to another. Your entire life as a human is analogous to one firing of one neuron in an enormous entity brain. This is big. That includes every single parallel dimension, every single version of you where you died, you died of being dropped on your head, or you died of a drug overdose, or you died of a car accident. Every single version of reality that you went through and experienced and that final life that you played the symphony perfectly and you ascended is all part of only one neural impulse that is firing or one thought that is happening in this great brain. And what the great brain is thinking is the thought, I am God. That is what the central core timeline is. All of the periphery is exploration of the self, of the identity of who you are and who you're not. Because a lot of things are not God. And this is a big part of my teaching. Stuff goes to entropy, stuff that's been on the membrane of death. What are the putis? What are these peripheral versions of self that might be like an ax murderer or insane or whatever? That's all not God. Do you get it? This is why I was so enraged about shadow work um, because shadow work when it is done erroneously or poorly requires that the experiencer identifies with many, many things that are not God and not God self as if they are yourself. As saying like, that's the real me, that's the real me, that's the real me. None of that is the real you. It's very harmful and corrosive to your true self to have to identify with stuff that's not the real you, which is mostly done under torture and coercion 
And then you feel a lot better because he's like, oh, good, good job. I broke your soul. Good job. I broke your spirit. And you agreed to the, uh, the, the, um, you know, uh, horrific untruths. Life will be so much easier for you now. Do you get it? It's like being a slave or being a POW who is tortured. Like, good job on breaking your soul. Life will be so much easier for you now in flawed shadow work that you have uh, adopted as self these things that are totally not God. My face tells you I'm being facetious. No, it's horror. It's a horror and it's a betrayal of yourself. Never betray yourself. Never betray your true self by agreeing to embrace certain personality characteristics that are not the real you and that are not the real God just for the convenience of some supposed schoolhouse for learning that is actually a torture factory. Remember that I told you that. Um, at the end of the process of refinement, when you are in alignment with the source, the thought that you are thinking is I am God. And you don't stop thinking that thought. You keep on thinking that thought. You're like, I'm God. Wait, play the, play the music. I'm God. I'm still God. I am God. I'm God. I'm God. You keep thinking that thought that you don't stop thinking that thought. And of course, there are many other thoughts as the foundation that many other thoughts are based upon. But never stop thinking that thought. I am God. Uh, many, many people have had the realization that I am God. I came from the source. I circulated throughout the physical realm, had many experiences, and then circulated back. I am God. However, all of these beings had the experience from a slightly different direction. And here I use a phrase that I like a lot. I call it the omnidirectional eye or the viewpoint of God. So the omnidirectional eye, which is the viewpoint of God, contains all of these. It's a, a multifaceted life experience. A microbe has a different experience from a human, from a redwood tree, from a dolphin, from the planet herself, from a, a person that lives on a totally different planet. All of these are part of the omnidirectional eye of God. And these are all beings who have recognized their innate divinity and that they are part of a much larger consciousness. When one understands that one is part of a much, much larger entity of consciousness and that you are a tiny little spark within a brain, that it is so large to even conceive of, then you don't look at the wormhole as death. I'm letting it sink in. Because when you fly through a portal that is known as how experts do star travel, you're going to go through the singularity in a star. When you ascend and you go back to the destination that is also the source that emitted you, your temporal ego might be like this. This is white knuckle. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. But your true self is like, I'm not afraid. I am literally remembering and embodying exactly who and what I am as a neural impulse in the mind of God. None of this is something to be afraid of. You look at it as rejoining yourself and having an opportunity to have even more consciousness. So in my notes, as I've spoken now so much about consciousness and awareness, there's also the sense of anti-awareness. And I do talk about those beings who occupy the interstices, that there are the final moments of each person's existence on the membrane of death. But I already got you about this and I will reaffirm, it does not make you a bad person. Again, if you die as a hapless explorer, you are not a bad person. But there are those that are like trying to hack the system in many, or game, game the system in many ways. Like I told you about the process of cloning or using crap time machines, things that create ununtieable knots. It's the myth of a Gordian knot, a knot that can never be untied, a self-conflicting time loop that can never be resolved. And they think, ah, that is eternal life. That's not eternal life. You know, it's eternal life. Remembering that I am God is eternal life being smeared on the membrane of death like a turd that refuses to flush it's not eternal life you got it and i know you're laughing too um although we merit moving onward by refining ourselves to the point of passing through the wormhole this is not judgmental they were the wrong shape to exit the wormhole so to get through the wormhole you have to be like super, super skinny it's, it's a very, very tiny doorway. You have to be shaped exactly right. Um, to contrast this with people who exist as fatty blockages on the membrane of death, they are not super skinny. They are rather bumpy and lumpy. They can't get through the doorway. 
those are beings, uh, some of us, uh, so some of the beings who are on the membrane of death never had corporeal existence. I talk about them. They're the ones who went away from the source. Initially, they said, I am non-God. I don't belong with God. I don't belong moving at light speed at infinity, being emanated into reality. See you suckers, I'm getting out of here and decided to go to entropy and then somehow um, screwed it up midway through. I didn't actually go to entropy and decided to sustain themselves like vampires by drawing off of the life force energy of the living. They definitely need to go to entropy. That is also part of your job as God to be able to say, you, you, and you, you are not supposed to be living in my hallway. You are not supposed to be living on the membrane of death in my body, on my chakras. And you definitely are supposed to go to entropy as a song that doesn't play. I'm gonna play the song of things that don't actually exist. There's no music there. That's like a composition by Philip Glass that's called the Song of Silence or something like that. It was the, it's actually a real song. People, how do you play that song by Philip Glass? The guy comes out in his tuxedo. He sits down at the piano with a great deal of formality. Everybody in the audience sits there waiting and the song begins, he plays nothing. And then they all laugh, at, and they all, and actually they don't clap at the end or laugh at the end. Then he gets up and walks away. It is the song that was played. Um, some beings never became fully submerged in the density where you can learn. That's where you and I are. This is a good spot to be. You're like, I'm submerged here. Sometimes things are difficult and I'm in existential difficulties. In those difficulties, just remember this, you are here for a reason. What is that reason? Being here allows you to become more wise, accrue wisdom, accrue light, learn and grow. Even though life here can be filled with profound levels of pain and suffering, you are not here for pain and suffering, but being here allows you to grow. Some of the beings who are stuck on the membrane of death never came into physicality density. They don't have these opportunities to learn and grow. It's very big. They're like stuck consciousnesses that never evolved. The whole process of this experience is to evolve. Um, beings who have never gone through the refinery of consciousness, they lack the capacity to eat unconditional love. So that's also a big thing. They got themselves on the membrane of death. They are away from God, but they can't eat unconditional love. So they are very, very hungry. They can only eat the lower vibrational energy from beings who have been submerged in the temporal world, things that we experience like sadness, grief, rage, and sorrow, and all of the life circumstances that create those experiences. But I'll also say, and this is not part of my notes, but remember, uh, they were at one point hunters or predators that are like, hmm, we're just going to eat all this sadness, rage, and grief that is in existence. And that's us doing our job for God. But then they're like, hmm, there's not enough sadness, grief, and rage. Let's invent cancer. And then we'll get a lot more sadness, grief, rage. Let's invent all of these different ways for people to die. And then we can eat all of that. They once were noble hunters or predators, like a lion stalking a gazelle. Now it's a canned hunt. Do you get it? On a human farm. And they created intentional circumstances for misery to generate as much misery as possible to keep you trapped here for the canned hunt. It's all not fair and not the way it's supposed to be. I assure you, it is not how it is supposed to be. But this part of my teaching is very interesting. Back to the shadow. In basic light dynamics and optics, you have a physical object, light falls upon the physical object, and then there's where light does not go as a result, that's the shadow. A valid shadow work would be about looking at the ways in which the ascended masters have personality characteristics that have not been resolved. Someone's getting a hug over here that have not been resolved and that need to be resolved in, without being distracted and speaking more eloquently here. Some of those putis that exist on the membrane of death are actually the residual consciousnesses of pre-ascended masters those who have not yet gone through the recycling or refinement process enough to be in alignment with being an ascended master and are stuck in their development. They got left back in third grade and they got left back so many times that now they're like 79 years old and they're still in third grade. You got it? But if those guys actually got resolved and actually went on their journey to keep on learning, eventually they would become ascended masters. So this is big because ascended masters have to clean up their trash. 
They have to take responsibility for everything they've ever done. It's in the contract or it's in the agreement of what it is to be an ascended master. So in many ways, if you are ever troubled or distressed by a consciousness residue that is a dead person, that is stuck on the membrane of death, that wants to live and sustain itself by taking your creative life force energy, you can kick that up to the higher echelons of the administration, to the ascended master that is responsible for that creature. That is actually its own unrefined consciousness self. That it, because here's being an ascended master, you're born, you make mistakes, you die, you hit the membrane of death, you dissolve, you go back to the beginning, you try it again. Some of these consciousnesses are stuck and they're not dissolving and going back to the beginning, but if they did, they would eventually become ascended masters. There's a version of them as an ascended master at infinity. And if one of these demons is trying to eat you, you can be like, oh, ahem, 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 madam or Mr. Ascended Master. It appears as if an erroneous former version of yourself that is over here on the membrane of death is trying to eat and consume me and do bad things to me. I think you should do something about it because it's basically reigning in or taking responsibility for the lower ego or negative or unresolved or harmful ego characteristics and reality states of uh, what it was on a journey to become a divinely perfected aspect of God. I know. If they all made the journey without ever hitting the membrane of death, then they would say, I'm an ascended master, can't possibly be one of my demons because I never hit the membrane of death and never left anything unresolved over there. So um, you're going to have to go and talk to someone else about that. But if it's connected in any way to an ascended master that went through the process of death refinement and then eventually ascending, then yes, they are through cosmic law um, required to be responsible for their dirty socks. They made a pile of dirty socks that's living on the membrane of death that didn't get resolved yet. And that pile of dirty socks is trying to eat you. So um, that's very, very big. Uh, okay. Occupiers of the interstices are the flat shadow versions of the ascended masters. And this has everything to do with your day-to-day -day experience of being attacked by demons. Got it? Has everything to do with humanity's experience of being subjugated under overlords for tens of thousands of years and humanity's current bid for freedom on the individual and collective basis. Attacked by the lower vibrational version of selves of beautiful being, beings of pure love. So their beings that we love are these beings of pure love that are beautiful. They're in alignment with divinity and they know exactly who they are. But on their journey, they have or have had lower vibrational versions of themselves that might have been angry, destructive, violent, or any of these negative ego characteristics, and that have been on the membrane of death unresolved, and that have been troubling us, the living. So in self-defense against negative thought entities, sending these blockages into the sun for reprocessing. So when I talk about this and sending them into the sun for reprocessing. Please don't mistake my language because I just did a whole teaching on path of light about the green box. Grid workers, light workers, if you encounter something that seems to be a place where light energy gets stuck and you want to remove that blockage, you send the light back to the sun and the stars and the network of consciousness so that it may be reabsorbed and continue on its journey. But you do not send the blockage back to the sun and to the source because the blockage is actually something that is not supposed to exist. And that would be like getting a free ride back to the source when you're actually supposed to go into entropy. These are not physical places, these are energy levels. So here I am at energy infinity, energy 1000, that's the infinity point of being and having God energy. And then here's the experience of having less than infinite energy and, um, you know, sucking energy off of the living over here. W what we want to do is take all that energy and send it back home up here. But whatever is the personality characteristic or the apparatus that is waylaying consciousness on its journey, we actually don't want to send it back home because you know why the, sh the shipping costs are incredibly high. 
have you ever had to ship something heavy? It's like, okay, great. I'm going to send you this piano via UPS. Your shipping costs will be whatever, $10,000. It's like, that is a heavy piano. And PS, that is a lot of money. The cost to send back this heavy thing that's not supposed to be up here to up here is an infinite amount of energy and it's wasteful and it puts the entire circumstances of reality out of balance. The, the evil thing, lack for lack of a better word, the green box is like, hooray, I got shipped to the warehouse where I wanted to get to all along because that's what you do. You understand if you want to get, if you don't have any energy and you want to get to the state of total energy havingness, you stand in front of someone who's on their journey and make their life hard being like, I'm going to F with you. And then finally, the person is like, I'm done with you effing with me. I'm going to send you back. And he's like, woohoo, hooray. I'm finally getting what I want, which is a free ride and a ticket at your expense and at the expense of the entirety of consciousness back to the place where I'm actually not supposed to go to. Actually, don't spend $10,000 of your UPS money trying to send this piano over to the state of total energy. Please send it um, cash on delivery at no expense over here to entropy. Entropy would be like the graveyard for pianos, the place where, piano, where pianos go to no longer exist. And uh, it costs no shipping costs to send something there because what you do is reclaim all of the energy from it. So it's basically like saying, hmm, there's this piano over here that's not supposed to be here. It's actually not supposed to be up here. It's supposed to be over here. So that means that I'm gonna get, I'm gonna dismantle this and dismantle this, I'm gonna melt down this, I'm gonna melt down this, and I'm gonna recycle this. I'm gonna take back all of the stuff that makes it stuff, and then it's gonna exist in a state of non-existence. But all of that stuff was actually kind of important stuff that was misappropriated from other places because someone else over here is like, oh, thanks, thank, thanks for all of that brass. I'm gonna turn it into something that's actually supposed to be. And this person over here is like, yep, thanks for those piano strings, thanks for the wood, thanks for the ivory, thanks for this, thanks for that. Like. That's where all that stuff was actually supposed to be when you bring it to where it is supposed to be. So these are levels of virtuosity that I'm describing to you. I have no judgment or animosity towards anyone that might have a simplistic viewpoint and might have been acting from a good heart, but a simplistic viewpoint to say, scoop it all up in a butterfly net and send it all back to the light. Because I think that a lot of grid workers and light workers are very beautiful, have a very childlike innocence about them, and simply don't understand, oops, simply don't understand, um, let's say, macroeconomics as it relates to the energy of consciousness and where it's actually supposed to be going, that you might actually be in incurring in enormous debt of $10,000 by freighting something to the repair station that's not supposed to go to the repair station. So that's very big when I'm talking about these things, sending things into the sun um, for reprocessing. But when I talk about this in the class, in the class from 10 years ago, it's very beautiful because what I talk about is based upon this image over here. The sun and the stars, and this still relates to the beautiful path of light class that I've been teaching about. Um, the sun and the stars contain all of these amazing patterns. It is a sign. They're all these S-shaped curves. I'm not drawing it very well, but I'm just I'm making an approximation here. The light and like, here's the sun. I'm so fragmented right now. Here's the sun. And I've been finishing my, my sentences. Here's the sun. And it makes these beautiful, harmonic, integrated waveforms. It emits in a spherical shell of energy that is constantly emitting around it, beams of light, beams of consciousness, beams of timeline possibilities, time and awareness that are all perfect music. Let me play some perfect sun music. When you as an ascended master go into the sun, and now I'm just gonna draw like a little stick figure of you here in the sun. What happens is you also play that beautiful music in the sun and there is no difference between the song. And here's you. Let's play them both together. It's literally what happens. You fit as a perfect harmonic 
fractal version of the sun and of the mind of God within the mind of God. And all of this energy that flows through you that looks like, you know, these white beams of light, this energizes you. Wait, where's my cursor? I want to draw. I don't know where my cursor is. Uh, this energizes you. All of these perfect uh, waveforms, they don't destroy you. They energize you. They make you have more coherence and more longevity. Now I'm just gonna use red as a color for something that doesn't fit. If something that is not shaped the right way, like a key in the door to go through the frequency door goes into the sun, you know what happens? Like if it's got uh, shapes like this, those things get burned away because the energy from the sun is primacy. Like there's no way to get past this shape, but once it hits this, like, okay, now, now we're going to fight now. <laughs> Someone's going to emerge victorious and it's going to be this white line of perfect um, divine consciousness. The um, zig red zigzag lines simply cannot exist. They are erroneous. They are math problems done wrong. They are personality characteristics gone awry. They are something that is the wrong shape. When you put something that's the wrong shape into something that's the right shape, who wins? The answer is God. God wins. God wins. And it means that all of that energy that would flow through something that is the wrong shape would remove from existence the thing that is the wrong shape. Here's God. Kid, I notice you're the wrong shape. You can't be shaped like that around here. You're going to have to get shaped differently. Okay, then you can't be here. You got it? Like, tough but fair. Like you, you can't, you can't wear that around here. If you're going to wear that, this is what's going to happen. And um, again, this is going beyond human anthropocentric aspects of judgment of good and evil it goes just into what are you shaped like? I know it's been two hours and I haven't even taken any questions yet. I have to get questions, but let me just go through my notes just a little bit more. I'm, I'm kind of getting somewhere with this. I know this is a long teaching. I should get to questions. Hold on before I do questions. Okay. Um, you want to do something to resolve these negative thought entities, not have to simply tiptoe around piles of doo-doo for your whole entire life. These entities have not had to face the music for a very long time. You get it? Because they're supposed to be having their life review. Coaches dusting them off. Get that mouth guard back in there and get back in the game, kid. They're like, no, coach, I ain't doing that. So there's been a real flaw in the way that the system has been adjudicated for a long amount of time. Um, there must be a reckoning where they are unmade, where being unmade, look at and assess everything you've ever done in all consequences. There must be a reckoning for even those who are not willful participants in the assessment process. This insight helps redirect your journey in greater and greater alignment with this central timeline. And you learn each time you die, just like Groundhog's Day. So it really is everything about this that I share with you. It is a perfect, pristine system. I know people are like, but the brochure, this world is so effed up. I hate it here. I'm like, no, this really is a beautiful, pristine system. And what's supposed to happen is every time you die, you learn and you are refined and you come back to the beginning and you start it again. So for anyone that has had a loss, if there are people that you know and love and they've died or they've died from your perspective and they're no longer in the same world as you, one of the most truthful and comforting things to know is that they are not gone, but they are in a different area of time in a different version of reality, they're exploring different options. They're learning who they are by exploring different timelines and different things that are possible for them. But those possibilities don't always overlap with your timelines. So they're happening all the way over here and to your perspective over here, they are dead or they are gone or they are non-accessible, but their consciousness is still on its journey. To me, that is the ultimate comfort that every single one of us has as an inevitability, the destination of becoming an ascended master and achieving the I am God moment. I'm God. If you know someone who you love who has died, it doesn't mean they're not God. It means they are still on their journey of self-learning, wisdom gathering, reflection, contextualization that will bring them to that moment when they are God. 
And when we go back to the whiteboard and I show you this drawing that looks like all of these ascended masters coming together like a dandelion seed head, you will meet your loved ones again here. You will meet your loved ones again here as you become an ascended master and you align with that version of yourself that is the divine perfection at the epicenter of reality. And all of these other trajectories have also done the same thing. That will also happen with every person that you've known and loved and lost through death. And that includes um, definitely your cats and your dogs and, um, you know, animals who are important and special to you because you know how much my dog is important and special and a family member to me. And before, um, when I, I, I joke before I had my dog who was my boss, I had a furry overlord who was a cat. She was very important and special to me too. And also like I've had humans in my life that have died and that they're also important friends to me that I loved. And um, they're on their journey. All of those beings that I just spoke to you about are all um, worthwhile, beautiful consciousness that does not deserve to be uh, discarded in any way. No one is disposable. And also neither cats nor dogs nor any of my friends or relatives in life. No one was an ax murderer. None of them were like severe psychopaths or anything like that. They were all just good people on their journey. And uh, my cat died of an animal attack, but most of these other people that I know uh, in my life, uh, mostly they died from cancer. It doesn't make you a bad person, not at all. And like, so whatever, 89% of our population gets cancer at some point. Um, no, it doesn't make you a bad person at all. Um, but it's uh, a timeline that I wouldn't want everyone to have to explore. And so there... Uh, actually in a different area of the time field. All of my friends that died of cancer, there are versions of reality where they didn't die of cancer because maybe different things happened in their life. Maybe they either thought different thoughts, got exposed to different food, water, and, and, and um, impurities, had different things in their life, or responded to their cancer diagnosis differently. That's all. And that is um, very loving and very compassionate. And so they're just exploring different timelines. But the point is, they are all the way over here in a different area of reality. And I'm over here on this area of reality and our realities don't overlap. So they are alive in an area over, of reality that I do not and cannot access, um, but they do exist in some, in some place. And also to them, to their very valid viewpoint, I am the one who died. Like maybe to my cat, I went out for cat food one time and then got hit by a car and never came back home and someone else had to adopt my cat. Or for my friends, uh, maybe, you know, from their perspective, uh, instead of moving away from Woodstock, whatever, I had a cerebral aneurysm, fell down dead one day. And then they all remembered me and, you know, think of me fondly. And they're like, yes, she's you know, doing what she loves in a heavenly state somewhere. It's like, well, actually I'm on a different timeline with an art studio and doing music and doing all happy and healthy and doing all the things I love to do. Um, but I'm not accessible to them. But we will reunite at that epicenter of time. But everybody's going to change and grow. So just remember that. And I tell that to you all the time in my class because I can say this because I, I know, I know guys, from where I'm coming from, I know this is the truth. I might not have this face, you get it? I might not have a face, two arms and two legs. The transformation and metamorphosis can be so profound that you might not have the same hair, the same shirt, whatever, the same earlobes, but I will still be recognizable to you because you will know me through my eternal personality characteristics. What are some of my eternal personality characteristics? Super creative lighthearted enthusiasm, positivity, and also definitely positivity and creativity as a response to like crappitude and bad stuff happening. Definitely relentlessly positive in uh, all of those uh, um, circumstances and an eyedropper full of compassion and a spoonful of, um, you know, um, what are some of my other, Sp spoonful of leadership um, and inspiring others. Um, these are some eternal personality characteristics that are in me because I say this, why do I say this? I'm a harmonic waveform. I've come in and out through solar portals a lot. I know who are the eternal aspects of self, who I really am. And so that's why I'm not white knuckling like, ah, 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 I'm going to go through the 
membrane of death or I'm going to hit the membrane of death. I'm going to go through the solar portal. Not that way because I'm like, this is really okay because the true nature of who I am remains untarnished and is eternal. And the other things that are not eternal go by the wayside and they do not come with me on my journey. So when you guys come to recognize me at the epicenter, you're going to recognize and know me by all the parts of me that are eternal. And I will do the same for you. Do you get it? Then this is what it means when I say these words. These are deep things. When I say, thank you for seeing me on my journey. I am not talking about my temporal self. I'm not talking about the aspects of me that leave or go. They won't be there. When you see someone on their journey and you're a sacred witness to them, you see their true heart and you see who they truly are and you see the true shape of their face and you know who they are inside. And then you meet them again and you meet them not as they were like stuck in time from 25 years ago. They grow and change and evolve and you meet them as their perfect version of self. And that's so big. That's so big. It, it gives me chills that when I think about my friends who passed on um, you know, from cancer, and most of them were like in their 30s, not that old, they weren't perfect people. They had a lot to learn. I will meet their perfect divinely ordained self and they will meet me as a perfect, you know, divinely um, um, whatever honed and sculpted form. Eat, that's what it is to be an ascended master for each one of us. Um, let me read a little bit more. Um, when you've reached this core persona, you don't have to let go in order to exit reality and go through the wormhole. So that means that when you are living as an ascending master, you are already identifying with your core self. You're already like, you know something? I'm not this shirt. You can take this shirt away and I'm still the real me. You're already prioritizing your activities and the way that you interact with the world based upon the truest levels of yourself. So that when it comes time to go through the wormhole, you're not like, but wait, my job, because your job is your temporal ego. If you're whatever, like I'm a newscaster and I define myself by reading the news every night. You're going to go through the wormhole and you're like, they don't have newscasters on the other side, but my job, like that is not the real you. But what about being an artist? I'm an artist on this side of the wormhole. And when I go through the wormhole, I will still keep on being an artist of whatever type of paints or pigments are, are available in that level of reality. Um, we do this while we are on this ascension pathway. And it means that you're spending 100% of your energy on cultivating the stuff that matters and has longevity and will stick with you as you move forward. You learn life skills that are transferable life skills. So I've learned a lot of computer skills as I've been here, especially over the past two years or so, and I've built my resume. None of that comes with me through the wormhole, truly. Doesn't mean it's a waste of my time because it helped to sustain me, put groceries you know, on the table and help me to pay my bills and rent and things like that. But even as I explored these different computer, you know, whatever um, activities, as I built my skills and did things that could be commodified in the human marketplace the whole time, I'm like, I'm taking this lightly because I know that these are non-transferable skills, as opposed to when I do my art and music, I get up early in the morning to do this no matter what I need to do, because that's the stuff that really matters. That's the stuff that is eternal that I define myself by always in your life, define yourself by and make time for and prioritize who you are and the activities that define you as who you really are. And for me, same thing with being um, a dancer and a person who cultivates their body. Like you see my little exercise equipment there. I do that every day, no matter what is going on in my life, because that is a basic definition of myself, of who I am and what I do in life. And um, it's absolutely essential for me to do, do, do that, do those levels of cultivation. Hey, hold on one moment. Let me just uh, pause for a moment here. And also let me just affirm for everyone, like, don't worry, you don't lose your true sense of self if you don't dance or exercise for one day. Don't worry, it doesn't all evaporate. But I'm trying to say like, please always focus your energy and your activities on the aspects of self that will come with you through the wormhole. And you know what some of those activities also include? 
hugging and kissing your dogs and cats and children and loved ones, doing things that are often activities that we consider non-commodifiable things like just being, just existing. Like, you know, for me, my dance is a sacred dance and is non-commodifiable. And I do it as an expression of myself can be sitting under trees, working in your garden, looking at a mountain. These can be the definition of who you are on a profound, deep inner level that will come with you when you transcend reality. Those are incredibly valuable ways to spend your time. So to synopsize, earthly social dynamics and economic dynamics will say, kid, I will pay you $5 to dig this ditch over here. Be like, okay, I dig this ditch over here. But what you really need to do is prioritize. I need to sit and stare at this mountain for this amount of time, because that is something that's actually going to come with me instead of, or whatever, build this email list. Five bucks, build my email list. They're like, okay, I'll do that for you, but I also really need to make time to be able to look at and internalize the beauty of this mountain or watch a sunset because those are the things that truly come with you when you go through the wormhole. I have so many more things to say in the notes because I haven't even gotten to part two because part two is all about redefining death. Let me read it for you here. Oh, so I already read that part. All right, we'll wait. Before I go to that part, let me read this. When you die, you will not die. I'm gonna read it again. When you die, you will not die. You will become a part of something much larger that you are already a part of, but which you are not yet able to perceive. You are part of this much larger overarching entity of God consciousness. All of these experiences, including the experience of being attacked by lower vibrational shadow beings and becoming an ascended master, are all part of the journey of God consciousness coming to know itself. That last part is really big, and I hope that it gives definition to the existential question of why do we deal with these putis? Why is this happening to us? This doesn't seem fair. Call the Cosmic Complaints Department. I'll read it again for you. All of these experiences, including being attacked by lower vibrational shadow beings and becoming an ascended master, are all part of the journey of God consciousness coming to know itself. And then, well, I'm going to speak about this. When one directs these lower vibrational aspects of self into the sun, it is a washing away of the distorted aspects that are false, that are not who you really are or who that being is, and are left only with the true light of consciousness. So when you go into the sun and you have a sun bath, all of that stellar energy, which is light energy, which is information flows through your chakras. And since you are an ascending ascended master, it, it makes you go uh, like an engine that is perfectly tuned. No friction, total bliss, and all of that energy energizes you. When that energy is goes to when uh, one of these negative thought entities is exposed to that energy and they are malformed and that energy actually does flow through the membrane of death, you know, those um, side membranes there, when they actually are exposed to that energy of love, what it does is it washes away the distorted aspects that are false and that is not who they really are. So we as ascended ascending masters, ascending ascended masters, are on this journey that involves some aspect of being assaulted, being attacked by lower vibrational thought entities that are not 100% God. And as this 100% God light flows through those thought entities, what they learn about themselves is, ah, the light of me is not God. And it might be the entirety of them. It might be that the sunlight of God washes away 99%. And it leaves only 1% of them in existence, or it might be that it washes away 100%, that they might have been 100% phantasms, illusions, things that I call aberrances. Something that is aberrant is something that is not supposed to be in existence. It's an aberration. They might have been 100% aberrations and things that should not exist and that this is a real resolution that is a transferable job skill. 
of you coming to recognize what characteristics you truly are and what you truly carry forward into the future, and also to wash away from reality the existence of personality characteristics that are of these other entities or creatures that are aberrations that don't exist, that never exist, that never, never should exist. Um, okay, but let me read about them a little bit. Um, we are in the process of bringing light to that shadow area. Okay, wait, wait. So the whole system for oppressing humanity was set up by these occupiers of the interstices so they could feed. You guys know this. The sun, what that means is the sun has a huge blind spot, the sun and the stars, a shadow area where there is no light because you hit the membrane of death and instead of getting your life review, you get all this turmoil with demons and you get a lot of turmoil during your life too. All of that stuff is meaning that sun, there's signal loss for the sun and the stars. And they're supposed to have totality information with no signal loss at all. So we are in the process of bringing light to that shadow area or a better way of saying it is we are in the process of reestablishing 100% clarity of signal with no loss of signal from these occupiers of the interstices. And when we experience a psychic attack, you can send the attacker to have a sun bath, but I also talked about sending them to entropy, which is why I don't want you to be confused. Since I am made of pure love and there's nothing to eat off of me, I take them with love and bring them back to solar consciousness, the divine source of energy bathed in sunlight. And that is uh, not and all, where all that is not, you will be washed away. Okay, I do all of that stuff, but you guys also know I wrote this 10 years ago. And in the past two years, I've had so much psychic attack from demons, so much, and so much of them not, quote unquote, following the rules or the cosmic laws or behaving in the way that is supposed to be behaved. Um, so there have been many, many challenges. And what I do is not trying to take the green box and bring it back to the source or um, to force light to go into these beings. What I really do focus on at this point, and also that they've used technological contraptions, even though you're at the level of love to try to make you make food for them, that is a lower vibrational frequency food that you would not have made otherwise. I've experienced all of these things, which I'm like, oh, hum, time to change the teaching um, because they of course like are um, not following the rules and doing what they're supposed to do. But what I do is withdraw energy from them. And that does send them to entropy. Yeah, it's like, oh, if you've got 10 bucks of mine, I'm taking it back. And now you have zero bucks. And that's going to send you into a state of entropy and non-existence. So in my notes, what I say is they've perpetrated terrible crimes. And that is truthful. They are monstrous creatures, demonic and evil. That is truthful. Returning to the sun is an act of love ending hatred and torment and evil, which is washed away. So all of that is truthful. Um, all, my only new way that I have to say things is you might have to do things in a new way because like, just as we level up our, we evolved, they evolved also. So they don't necessarily respond as to the things that I wrote about 10 years ago. You might always have to be leveling up your game is what I'm trying to say. But I also talked about this. Ascended masters have to take responsibility for their lower selves. Uh, God consciousness wants to know itself, the totality, including the lower shadow self. So when you are attacked by a puti, there is an ascended master that is beholden to that shadow self. And I call upon you in order to rein in your lower vibrational negative self because it is attempting to harm me. So let's use some good guy like Gandhi, clearly a good person in life who tried to really be a saint. I'm talking, you know, Mahatma Gandhi from the subcontinent of India, amazing human being inspired so many different people. But even that guy has a version of self that is a lower self. That would be a putti. That would be a demon. And the point is, if it didn't get resolved, then that could be a putti demon that is somehow negatively harming you or feeding off of you. And if it is, it's totally appropriate for you to go to Gandhi, the ascended master and say, ahem, sir, oh, sir, pull on his, you know, garment a little bit. Be like, I think this belongs to you. Like this aspect of self over here that has not been resolved is somehow harming me. So because all time is now, you get it? So even though this guy is stuck over here and through many, 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 many revolutions, He's going to become this guy over here. This guy over here exists in the all time is now. And this guy over here hasn't yet become this guy. And this guy over here 
has to do something about this guy. All of these guys over here have to do something about all of these guys over here because all of these guys over here are not only hurting me individually, but they're the ones that are responsible for like um, satanic ritual abuse, harvesting sexual energy, profound misery, um, just the most distressing things that are going on in our lives. That Do you get it? The psychopath eventually becomes the ascended master if it goes through the washing machine enough times. That means that all of this psychopathology that we experience that is diminishing and imbalancing our world is owned by and emanates from a group of beings who eventually become the ascended masters. Uh, the beings who become the ascended masters must take responsibility for what they have emanated and what they have and haven't done in their lives, including all the stuff that they did when they were monstrous, demonic, devilish. What are the words that I used? Just trying to be accurate here. Demonic and evil. Monstrous, demonic, and evil. All right? Fair. But I don't want to focus that much. I like this teaching a lot more when I talk about you being a neurological signal in the mind of God. And also each ascended master is a particular flavor or a particular color, a particular recipe of personality aspects. And this is why I say that they're not all vanilla milkshakes, like bland, um, facile, having no persona. Like, no, they're not vanilla milkshakes and they're not doormats. And I don't want you to be one either. So you have to have your own certain recipe of desirable characteristics of exactly who you are and to be appropriately shaped that one wishes to carry forward into the future. The, the eternal version of you should be shaped correctly. So these are the personality characteristics that you wish to carry with you eternally into the future. Eternally is a long time, guys. It's like, really, you have to choose an outfit that really works for you, that really looks good. If you're gonna wear that as your dress for eternity, it must be a perfectly customized, tailored gown. It cannot be something that is, is anything less because when you make the full circuit from the source outward into the physical and back to the source again, those aspects exist eternally. It's a perpetual motion machine that continues forever. You're part of a perpetual motion machine, guys. That's why it is inevitable for you to return to the source. Um, I have so much to read about. That's why I'm, that's why I'm making that noise. <laughs> Good, I'm almost there. Hold on a second. Which aspects of your DNA, which characteristics, and choose which type of thoughts you are sending forward into the future? This is big. Okay, so wait. We each have many thought beings speaking to us and putting thought energy into us through our corporeal existence. And the ones that stay with us are the ones who are eternal and they make up our chakras when they're in perfect alignment and keep our chakras in perfect alignment. So the beautiful saintly um, person known as Mahatma Gandhi can be a person that is influencing you and living through your DNA, especially when you read their teachings, when you read their books or when you try to exemplify what they did in their life in your life. Um, we each have many beings, thought beings speaking to us. When you align yourself with the right thought beings, you will be an ascended master and live forever within a larger body of thought consciousness. That's very big. And sometimes when we align ourselves with the right thought beings, sometimes that is like, you know, Gandhi is very well known or very has a lot of no notoriety, but sometimes you align yourself with thought beings that like, nobody knows about this guy, but it is still a positive, eternal thought being. So it's not only those who became famous or had a book written about them or something like that. It's many, many, many of them. And they are our coherent light family. And they support us literally just like your skeletal system supports you, hold you upright in life, help you, guide you, and nourish you. You align with the right thought beings and you'll be an ascended master and live forever in a larger body of thought consciousness. That's what this is. What the Getting away from the putis because I feel like that is always such an energy drain. Um, what you're doing as an ascended master is becoming an eternal thought impulse on the network of stellar consciousness. And this is what my Aurora Collective is. And you do this through your own 
aspirations, disciplines, studying, and self-cultivation. Um, the non-physical thought beings that you choose to be a part of you in your life, essentially you're choosing who gets to live through your life. Unabashedly, I let John Coltrane live through my life. He was not a perfect person in life. I think he had drug problems and all sorts of things like many jazz musicians do. This is not about that. It's not about his frailties as a human. I feel like his music was genius. And I'm so honored when I'm like, I want to live, like have those songs live through me or Jimi Hendrix. You know, I love these two guys. That's what I'm talking about. That there are versions of both of those two musicians, both of who abused a lot of drugs that I don't condone at all. Clearly, I want people to do a much healthier lifestyle, but that they had amazing artistry. I find them very inspiring in the purity of their self-expression and that I know that there's a self-cultivated version of each one of them that transcended their self-destruction. You will meet them again in heaven and um, that it, at the epicenter or at the source, they will be there, but they might be different and not self-destructive because you can't identify with your self-destruction. You get it? You can't be like, yep, the heroin is what made me who I am or the, the cocaine or whatever it is. You can't be because then you're not going to be there. Which, which aspect of your DNA, which characteristics, choose which type of thoughts you are sending forward into the future, because that's what this is really about, coherence and longevity. So those two musicians I just mentioned, Coltrane and Hendrix, um, their music has coherence and it lasts. People are still listening to it, loving it, and it will go forward because it's really, really good. It's genius level stuff. You get it? That's what every artist aspires to do. Everybody who is here, um, even beyond a definition of an artist, aspires to leave a legacy of making something that is important and worthwhile and informative and nourishing and uplifting to the people that will come later on your journey. This is what it is to have longevity. You have longevity of your thought forms and what you've done in the world and what you have sent out. So in order, you're sending it into the future. In order to make it through the wormhole, sometimes it's necessary to let go of aspects of your persona that no longer serve. For example, a particular hat, a particular scarf, or a particular addiction. That's not who you really are. Let it go. And some behavior patterns lead you to the membrane of death, and that would be considered you know, these self-destructive behavior patterns, like what I was just talking about. Thank you for letting me get through my notes. Now I hope these questions and comments are all still relevant. Charlie B, all the way from back at the beginning, says... If in the time of ascending from Atlantis, nobody died, everybody takes the path of least likelihood, yes. Why is this time different where we must experience death? Could we in this time not take the path of least likelihood on the first try in this era? Beautiful question. And I love your mind and I love everything that you're, you're saying and thinking there. Playing the notes correctly the first time and ascending without hitting the membrane of death is the brochure, the way that it was always supposed to be, and is an option that is available to you, me, and everyone here, especially since I've been here and I've been flying rainbow lasagna and teaching all of you guys about flying rainbow lasagna. It is not necessary to play wrong note, 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 until finally, ah, I finally got to the right notes. You can actually jump directly to the right notes. You are not beholden or contractually obligated in some way to play all these wrong notes and hit the membrane of death over and over and then come back and try it again. Far from it. In fact, that actually is super, it bloats time. That adds a lot of time bloat of stuff that didn't have to be explored, but was explored. So if you can already transcend those um, pitfalls, please do. And the, the wisdom accrual and transcendence of ego pitfalls can be something like, I can sense that that's gonna be a terrible life journey. I'm not gonna make that mistake. Like marrying the wrong person. Sometimes you're like, go into the altar. Dum, dum, da, dum. I'm going to ruin my life. I better get out of this marriage or I think I'm going to die. You know what? Don't get married. If that's the way you feel, dum, 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 then be like, no, get out, get out now. Don't go through the whole bad marriage and then five years and then many children and then the divorce. You get it? You don't have to do that or the wrong job, wrong relationship, 
wrong job, bad tattoos, any of these things, your intuition might be telling you like, don't do it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to explore every single wrong note. Um, and that is actually where we are in the time field now at these moments of um, huge self-empowerment at being able to make positive life-affirming choices and not being strictly deterministic. Determinism would say wrong note, wrong note, wrong note, wrong note, wrong note, wrong note until you by trial and error finally get to the right note. Um, so in ancient Atlantis, all of us hit the right note. We were the best band. Nobody ever played a wrong note and nobody ever died. And none of us occupied the membrane of death. Although these other miscreants occupied the membrane of death. Where we are right now, for some people, they will occupy the membrane of death many times and then continually come back. But hopefully my teachings and also many other circumstances that are here available at this time will make it so that you can streamline your journey. Maybe you won't hit the membrane of death at all, or maybe you just hit it a couple of times and be like, oh, got the whammy. And then your math teacher will be like this, red X over here. And you're like, I knew I shouldn't have eaten that sandwich. I know, go back and try it again. That's it. It could have been, a, I, I'm joking about like the deadly tuna sandwich, um, but excellent question. And every single one of us uh, really has in this generation, the opportunity to go directly to ascension without having to ever experience death again. Although I do not decry anyone who experiences death or has a family member who died, they didn't fail at all. They're still on their journey. They're still going to learn. So if you die, please don't feel like a failure or any kind of thing like that. Dust off, figure out what you did wrong, get back in the game, You know, do it differently and better next time. Okay, this is a private a direct message to me I'm going to answer this, even though it was a direct message to me, because I, I, I won't use anybody's names, but it was a question about suicide. What if despair makes someone kill themselves? Like, do what, what happens? Because there's, again, many teachings from the Christian church that I feel are corrosive on this, that are not loving and not compassionate. No offense, I'm not trying to offend Christians here. But when people kill themselves, like that is seen as one of these um, irredeemable sins that sometimes makes people think like, yep, you're going to burn and suffer in hell for forever. I hope my voice and my face shows that I don't believe in that, that I believe that when you self-destruct, some people kill themselves through eating too many Twinkies. Some people kill themselves through injecting too many drugs. Some people kill themselves through not seeking medical care when they should. Some people kill themselves through being in bad relationships and being in bad um, business arrangements and jobs. And some people kill themselves by taking a GUN and actually shooting themselves with a bullet. And all of those things, self-destruction, are things that like you need wisdom accrual in order to recognize that, that that those were things that you should not have done and that it didn't bring you to peace, didn't get you to your destination and your goal, it requires compassion, forgiveness, mercy, and um, kind of getting people back on the right path. So those self-destruction, so those aspects of self-destructive, no, you don't deserve to suffer in hell or be stuck on the membrane of death for forever if something like that happens. Yes, of course, you get a chance to try it again. In fact, that is what so many people who kill themselves think and feel. Um, there's so much there. Like when people actively self-destruct and commit suicide, you know, through like overdose or whatever, traffic accidents or, you know, some form of self-violence, um, they're doing so because they think that it will be an end to their pain. Like their suffering has been so profound. They've been in so much pain. They think this will end the pain but it does not actually end one's pain. It doesn't solve things. What happens is either you end up on the membrane of death with life review and also having to deal with the pooties and get, getting past that whole thing in order to get another opportunity in your life. Or let's say if you went into a different existence in a different context completely, you would still have to face all of your baggage is not the right word but let's call it like your macros your scores if you're like okay your macros you had like this much compassion you had this many f-ups you had this many, like what are your general scores all of that would follow you to the next situation if you're born as whatever a flat worm and then guess what you've got this much to deal with and this much to deal with and this much to deal with like all of those things you're going to have to deal with it. And that's part of cosmic law because you have to balance the scales. You have to write things 
that were imbalanced, right? Things instead of, I wanted to say that that are wrong, but I really wanted to say put into balance that which has gone out of balance. So death is, uh, suicide is not an escape. It is not a way to avoid responsibility for one's experiences. It's not the wormhole out of here. And also death is not the wormhole out of here. And most of my friends who died um, kind of, uh, they got cancer. I think they kind of fell into it. Some of them fought pretty hard, but some of them were like, death, take me away. And I was like, wow, like that is not the way you get out of here. And some of them will see that as a red X on their homework but it wasn't right for me to say that to them in life. You get it? Because I don't think that they could have heard it from me or from anyone, but I hope that they heard it in their life review because life is sacred and life is a gift and we have to fight with everything we have to be here and to make the most of it and to stay alive and to have longevity. So there's not a punishment as some religions try to say like, you killed yourself and now you deserve blah, blah punishment. Really the punishment happens as soon as the person faces life review. They're like, I killed myself. I was in an enormous amount of pain. This didn't solve anything. I lost a lot. I hurt a lot of people. Killing themselves, self-destruction, suicide hurts a lot of people. It hurts the people that you leave behind. And that is um, one of the worst things about it. It's not just the damage that is done to oneself, but it's the damage that is done to families and to communities that causes suffering to spread. Um, so there's just a lot, it's a big debt when someone does something like that. It's not insurmountable. There are all, uh, God is so loving, compassionate and forgiving. You guys have no idea. Maybe you have some idea, but maybe I would just say this. It can be hard for the human intellect to even comprehend the levels of goodness, compassion, pure love, positivity, uplift, guidance, amazing, whatever, mastery and teaching that we receive from God. Because we hear all of these stories and all of these things about what deity is and what deification is that are a lot of times about judgment and egocentricism all of that, I hope you can tell by my face because it caused me so much pain. It's all religious trauma and abuse. And that is not who and what God is. God is so merciful and so understanding. And also you are God and you love yourself. Um, so this sense of uh, suicide and death and self-destruction is always seen through the ultimate lens of compassion that it is possible to receive. But with all of that, I'm going to say to you guys, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. That is the mantra. Even when you think you can't keep going, sometimes that is the only thing you can do is take a breath and stay alive, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. Stay alive. Miracles happen. You guys stick around for the miracles. And it's really, really, really important. So anybody who's facing a poor prognosis in their health or has family members who are, please keep going for life. Please um, fight for life as much as you possibly can. But then what about if you have an animal and it's better for them to be euthanized? Like, of course, like we don't want to have endless suffering. Of course, if it's inevitable, what you do is you give your animal the best life that it possibly can do. And then you, you know, have the lethal injection when they start to really um, be in profound levels of pain. But this also like that's different for an animal or something like that than it is for a conscious human because I didn't really even talk a lot about having a conscious death. Having a conscious death, although it might involve pain and suffering can actually be a huge gift when the person is like, okay, like, you know, you're gonna die. You know what's going on. You know, you have a terminal illness. You know what these feelings are. It doesn't feel fun. It doesn't feel good. But for some people, they do um, this long, slow terminal death as opposed to fast hit by a Mack truck on the um, highway because they need that self-reflection. Truly, your higher self will tell you, you know something you needed to decline over these many years so that you could have this conversation with this person, work this thing out here and come to a resolution and an acceptance on this. And it, it's not fun to live in pain or on painkillers or any of those things that people go through when they are in end of life care. But sometimes that is what they need for their particular journey. Again, that's not always my place to say stuff like that. Because if I say stuff like that to someone's family or their person, it comes out the wrong way. They're like, you think it's good for grandma to be dying in a hospital bed with morphine and all these different things? Like, no, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. But you know something? People actually do choose and create their own ideal circumstances for death and passing that gives them their best opportunity to be able to resolve the things they need to resolve and also sometimes have a positive impact with their death. 
got to look at it through that light, which is, I know, asking a lot when people are suffering a lot in their, in their day-to-day lives. Trish, let's talk later. I'm reading what is private here. Yeah, thank you so much. Trish gives me a public that I will read. It says, Aurora, if our chakras are not perfectly aligned and we keep expanding, how are we then affecting the earth and the universe? Thank you. Beautiful question. Yeah, our destabilization absolutely radiates outward and touches upon all these other life forms and organisms and systems. Our planet, our entire solar system, the sun star that emitted us, all life everywhere. That's why when you heal, your healing rectification and creating a stable foundation moving forward has an impact that's positive on all of those things. But when your chakras are out of alignment and you have a bunch of putis or crapola on the membrane of death, that destabilization inside of you similarly destabilizes everything. And we're not the only planet that has poop, crapola, death, and putis and things like that. So um, it's very big. Uh, the cleanup actually needs to be concurrent with a lot of other things that need to be cleaned up too. Pedro says, soul, spirit, consciousness are the same or different aspects of the same question mark. I didn't include ego because it clearly is a separate concept. Good question. So the way that I use these different words, when I talk about soul, I'm not talking about something as humans often depict it like Casper, the friendly ghost, like a white sheet that kind of can come on and off of you. Or same thing about your spirit, not just a white sheet that is separate from your physicality presence. Your soul is the story of you, how I talk about this, your trajectory or your provenance, or the story of everything that you've been through up into this moment. And when somebody steals your soul or your soul is sold, what that means is something has usurped your willpower taken away your sense of being able to choose and direct your events and your consciousness and your flight through time. Soul is intimately tied to and synonymous with self-responsibility. Because when you do something and then you say, it wasn't me, blame that guy over there, you, you lose your soul. That is how you lose your soul. So you maintain yourself when you're like, ah, oh, I made that big pile of poop right there. That was me. That was me. Um, when you say that, I didn't make that big pile of poop. A demon was inside of me. Somebody else did it. Mommy, daddy did it. I did it because of mommy and daddy. I did it because of my ancestors. I did it because of society and the government. I didn't even really do it. That's when you lose your soul, All right? Spirit, I would define as all of these subtle energies that I usually draw and paint, things that cannot be weighed or measured on a scale, things that are layers of your body that are still very much a part of you but that are not necessarily recognized as objective materialist science anatomy parts of you. They are ephemeral. And consciousness. Consciousness I define as a miracle, even beyond these layers of your being. Consciousness to me is ineffable, indefinable, and one of the great miracles of God, the oh, capacity to be sentient, capacity to be aware, and that consciousness is so valuable. It is a treasure of the world that is never discarded. That's why you don't just be like, this is me being like an imperious Caesar or whatever, send it to the membrane of death, send it to the membrane of death, send it to the membrane of death. Like, you know, like in the gladiatorial combat, like thumbs up, thumbs down, you consciousness, go to the membrane of death, go to the membrane of death. That's not what God is like. God is like, this is a spark of consciousness. It's so unbelievably valuable. I love you. I love you. I love you. That's what consciousness is. It is a miracle of unlikelihood, almost impossible to define. But I also will tell you that Christ, this awareness center in our body is defined by consciousness and that consciousness pervades all life everywhere. So uh, it's very deep stuff. Um, Pedro wants to know, how about we send the blockage to the sun's corona to burn the residues and then let the light go into the sun? That's very similar to what I was envisioning 10 years ago, the sense of taking one of these negative thought entities and literally putting it into the sun, which is a plasma being, and having all of that plasma energy flow through it, burning or incinerating or vaporizing away all the things that are not eternal and leaving behind only the things that are eternal. And he says, maybe not a good idea to send um, pooties so near to the sun, we don't want to contaminate it. Good question. Can the sun become contaminated with pooties, pooties and other um, things that are undesirable? My answer is that the sun and those consciousnesses that have achieved becoming a sun star have done so by passing the audition. 
just as you and I passed the audition to be here at this level. We may not know everything, but we're certainly on the journey of learning in good faith, doing our best. Same thing with the sun and the stars. They are nodes of consciousness in the great brain of God. They may not know everything. They are in the process of wisdom accrual as per my path of light class and everything that they're doing here as well. Um, they sometimes make mistakes or have things that are erroneous that they are learning about themselves, but they are completely well-intentioned and good. And I don't see them as being infected or infested by anything that is harmful that they then emanate outward into time. But what I do see is that they might have vulnerabilities in having energy siphoned off of them. That would be like taking, even if you got trillions of dollars, like one of these you know, guys here in the world, like the guy that owns Amazon or whatever, he owns so much, he's got trillions of dollars, but someone could still steal from him. And if they stole a million dollars, he might be like, hey, like stop stealing, that's a million dollars. Be like, you have trillions, does it really matter? It's like, yes, it does matter. I need those millions of dollars. Um, that's what I kind of think it's like for the sun. I think that it's kind of like, you've got all of this consciousness, all of this awareness, all of this magnificent power and gravity, literally. And um, that something else might come along and be like, hmm, I think I'll co-opt this or that from you. It's still not okay, even if you're a trillionaire, for someone else to co-opt your creative life force energy. So I think that's the danger for the sun and the stars. Not that they could be contaminated by something evil and then emanate an evil or like negative reality, but that something could be like, oh, since you have $7 trillion, I'll just take a couple of millions and then be like, oh, I'm looking in my wallet. I thought I had this many millions and I was going to do something really cool with it, but now it's gone. What am I going to do? I think that's um, much more of a problem. Pedro says the moment the I am God moment is felt by everyone at the same time, universal ascension. Thank you. That is what this class is all about. That's what this painting is all about. You're making my heart so happy right now because what happens with ascension is although it might not be synchronized according to the clock that we have on our watch or something like that, it is synchronized in a time outside of time. All of those timelines that come together into the epicenter of existence all meet and converge in one explosive, expansive moment. I am God. So this is big. Let's say I have that realization moment at 4.58 p.m. at February 22nd, 2023. But a blade of grass had that expansion experience realization moment last week. It looks like there is a distance of time between us, but there is no distance of time between us. We actually both have that in insight moment at the same time. So that little blade of grass is like, I'm God, and I'm like, I'm God. And guess what, Pedro? You're like, I'm God. And my dog is like, I'm God. This is what planetary ascension is going to be like for all of us. It is the concurrent, but outside of linear time, self-realization of and remembrance of God for every single one of us. It is enormous. It's so enormous and it's so positive and it's so nourishing and it's so amazing that I don't, I want you guys to live in the moment and appreciate all that you have, but I also really want you to look forward and anticipate with so much joy what it will be like to be in that moment. Because again, it is not death or destruction or non-being. It is the continuance of our being in that light of knowing I am God. You don't stop being God, you keep on being God. So then what will that be like when you are God? I am God, Pedro is God, the blade of grass is God, and we all exist at that convergence point. We're all gonna be like, I know you and you're God. I know you and you're God. I know you and you're God. It's going to be amazing, it truly is. Trish says, Pedro, I think that same moment would be when after the few crystallize, the many or the rest sorts of phase two. So again, it's kind of freeing because it means that we don't have to wait like, I'm ready to be God. Well, you guys kind of like get your act together and we can all be God together. Like you don't have to be that way. Just focus on your own attainment. Know that you will achieve that moment of recognizing and remembering that you are God in the divinely ordained moment that it is meant to be, and know that it will 
fit within the larger time structure perfectly, because that's what this whole thing is, with every other organism and creature and microbe that is having its moment of awakening. You don't have to make other people hurry up. You don't have to make yourself hurry up. You be secure in the knowing that these things will happen in divine timing, and that will be the greatest reward that you've ever experienced. Um, it will give so much meaning and justification to all of the suffering, hardship, and distresses that you have been through. All of that, you won't forget. You will be like, I trudged up this entire mountain and I got blisters on my toes because my socks were uncomfortable, but I kept on going up this mountain and I made it there. It justifies the blisters. You will be okay. You'll be like, I got blisters. It hurt my feet so much, but I made it here. And I know that your blisters are much, much more than just friction from your athletic shoes, guys. I know that your blisters are sometimes devastations to your souls, including the loss of loved ones, including that. That is part of our journey of ascended mastery, not only being attacked by negative thought entities on the membrane of death and how we respond to that, but also the loss of my cat, the loss of my friend Runa, loss of family members, anything that you're experiencing that might be similar, that it, your own diseases, your own um, moments of healing and fighting for your life, those are the things that you um, struggled through in order to get to your own personal miraculous moment of ascension of I am God. R Rima, Rima, thank you for being here, says Aurora, could what just talked about be summarized in the statement, it is not what you do, but how you do it? I think that there's a big part of that. I think that that's a good phrase um, because the we're talking about the um, cultivation of the truest levels of who you are. So for me, you know, I've been here as 20 years as Aurora and I've worked through many different social stratum from entry-level positions and crap jobs into much more elevated positions. I've done all these different things to, I'm like, I ate the buffet of life. I had to do that in order to learn. And one of the things that was always a truism for me because I've been aware this whole entire time is even if it seems like a not very glorious position, I do a good job anyway to understand like, it's not about, how much you're earning or whether you're famous or anything like that, but like coil up the electrical cord before you put it away. Don't just throw it in a closet in a big heap or like clean the window so that it really doesn't have streaks on it. Like to do the utmost in whatever you are doing. So in this sense, like what are the, cause what are my true personality characteristics that I came here with? I'm like, I do a good job no matter what. That's me. If, if you want to kind of be like when we meet again in a different, face place, but I might have a different face. You'll remember me by that characteristic. You're like, that's Aurora. She does a good job, even if no one's looking, even if it seems like it's an inconsequential thing. Um, that is a part of who I am. Um, and that this also relates to what are your true personality characteristics doing the things that really matter. So again, I worked at many jobs where it's like, it, you know, my coworkers actually pulled me aside and they were like, uh, took me by the shoulders. Aurora, look, we're gonna have to have a little talk. None of this stuff really matters. You got, you understand? Cause I'm like, but wait, we have to organize this and coil this electrical cord. They're like, none of this stuff really matters. I'm like, okay guys. Um, and they're not just on, you know, a nihilistic trip of nothing matters. They're really more on the sense of practicality. They're like, we're like, this is just a stupid job. Like nothing matters, you know, do, do, do your thing. And then, you know, earn five bucks and go home. Um, but, you know, I took everything very, very seriously. Mima says, I mean, the intention we bring into what we are doing. That's exactly it. For me, my whole entire life and everything that I've been doing and being here is an expression of an art project. So yes, I coil things up put them away properly, organize things and do things properly, even if I don't get paid more, even if no one's watching, even if it seems like it doesn't matter because it matters to me because it is part of my definition of self. And this goes more beyond even just like the coiling of electrical wires. How do we treat people? How do we treat people when no one is looking? How do we think of people internally? How do I you know, have my thoughts 
in reference to other people in the world because some people think like you can't hear what's in my mind i can think the cruelest things and i'm like no i don't do that do you know why that's not the real me the real me is constantly praying for the uplift of and resolution of and healing of almost all of these people that i interact with even evil people i'm like yeah that guy's really evil like let's pray for him like that he's gonna get healed that something's gonna get fixed inside of him or that he will go to entropy um i pray for so much in this world and that that is again a basic definition of self that no one can see it's the privatest part of myself even though of course i'm sharing it here with words to you um these are the things that truly define who you are who you are when no one's looking who are you with the the lights out you know um how do you act when um it's really times of great distress you're like well, i've only got three dollars how do i act like will i save two dollars for me and give one dollar to that guy will i give all three away will i keep all three for me i don't have judgments on these but i want you to know like these are like the defining characteristics of who we are in this time and place. It's a lot of why we face some of the things that we face. Pedro says, back to work, but I'm still listening with my cell. Love the lasagna, Pedro. Thank you for being here, even making time for us, even while you are at work. Same thing with, I know, lovely Charlie. Charlie B is here under these circumstances too. And Lucy hops in too. I just want to say my love and respect to everyone who takes time out of their work day and might even be listening in the background. Thank you so much for taking time to connect with these thoughts and ideas because I think that it's um, so valuable to step away from the things that are the temporal ego stuff, but you still gotta buy groceries and take time to focus on the things that are the more eternal things with longevity. Same thing with Adam hopping off. He says, thanks to everyone. Thanks always for having an archive of these lessons. You're so welcome. And thank you for your thoughts here, Adam. Last comment, Trish says, it's very important. So very important to heal and then expand, vibrate, oscillate. Otherwise we're counter expanding, we're condensing and shrinking. Yes. So, okay, I'm gonna say this here. We are on individual journeys of remembering that we are God. We are each transcending and healing from personal trauma. I think God is transcending and healing from trauma as well. I think that that is our healing, is God's healing. I get confirmation chills when I talk about these things, is um, profound and significant. Because I think humans tend to look at God as like, God, like you're divine and perfect and everything is great with you. You're swimming around in the heaven, doing the backstroke and feeling great. And I see God as the creator of everything, but also the experiencer of everything, including profound levels of suffering and trauma. And that God is also on this level of profound healing, love, and compassion. I'll tell you, I also pray for God. I pray for God's longevity as a perpetual motion machine and uplift and continuation and joyfulness to be able to reach God's greatest potential in the same way that I would pray for you or for my dog to feel something similar. And that, again, when you come right down to it, I am God, I'm praying for myself, but that this is when we get to unity consciousness. So this, I'll wrap it up pretty fast too. The I am God moment, that culmination is like a little spark plug jumping up here when all of these aspects of self recognize that we are God or that I am God and that it's that in itself is a profound experience of healing. I'm so sorry when you hear that dog barking, that is not my dog. And I find it so distracting and so distressing. Please I, I, forgive me for not being able to focus through that complete energy, just torture and horrific distraction. Good, it's done. Um, And there you can tell like, what was I thinking about? What was I talking about? I don't know, because I just got so upset by all the things that are going on. There's such horrible distractions. I will instead open the floor to questions and comments. I was trying to leave on something super positive. Instead, I'm like, oh, bullshit. Sorry, guys. Any other questions or comments for people? I really, truly wish I could have ended on a very beautiful, positive upward note. But instead, I ended on distress. But that's okay. This is part of the journey here. Any other questions or comments?
to be able to wrap things up in a positive way might be good, might be better. If not, I will end the recording, but I wanted to say something wonderful about God. Totally lost the opportunity. Okay. Ah, uh, Charlie B says, thank you for today and Ascension. And Trisha says, your light is shining through. Thank you very much for both of those beautiful comments that I think are a mental sorbet to any of the difficulties of the out of control dog downstairs. Charlie B, you're so very welcome. And I will tell you this, so you guys know I'm Aurora and that I've already been through the personal ascension of the way it was done on our planet before our planet was invaded a long, long, long time ago and genetically modified. And it is my great honor and my great joy to be here again. I want you guys to know that I do not look at this like a chorefulness and I never wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh no, I'm here again, trying to not, like Bill Murray, you get it? I do not feel like that at all. It is my great honor and my great joy to be a planetary protector and a guardian and a guide and an inspirer for everyone who is doing this for the first time under unbelievable duress. This is one of the hardest ascensions you will ever have to make. It, it is totally a very, very screwed up situation right now. It's part of why I am here, but it's also why I'm telling you like when you have that I am God moment and it synchronizes with other people, horses, a blade of grass, the reward is going to be so intense and so spectacular. It will be worth it. The toe blisters of this marathon will be so worth it. You'll remember this and it was worth it for me to be here to help make it possible along with the actions of many others. Trisha says, thank you very much for all the continuous inspiration and expansion. You're very welcome, Trisha, very welcome. Pedro says, I thought that ascension would be collective. Good to know it is individual. Ah, Pedro, it is both. It is both individual and collective. And that gives you the freedom because what if that guy over there isn't ready to graduate from third grade? and wants to go through a few more cycles, be like, oh, like, can I just ascend already? Because some people are fast students. And for you, it's like ugh, tedious to have to go through this again. Everything is done according as a meritocracy to your own needs and to your own um, rate of learning and personal growth. That's why that blade of grass that ascended last week was like, I'm not waiting for Aurora, I'm ascending now. And I'm like, good for you because I needed a little bit more time to learn about this, this, and this and process this, but we converge at the same moment outside of time. So your individual process of ascending happens when it is divinely ordained for you and same for everything else, but it is synchronized in a time beyond time. Rima says, Aurora, thank you for your teaching, you're so welcome. Lucy says, Aurora, you are glowing. Thank you for that. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's interesting. Lucy Trish was mentioning some aspects of my light and of my glow as well. Very, very pleased for you to recognize that. I'm pleased for you to see that. And yes, I'm very happy to share my light with you. I felt like today was a very uh, amazing day of having this energy flowing through me. And I'm so happy to share it with you because you guys, I'm very authentic. You see me on other days when I am like a whatever, ranting, raging against the machine, the unfairnesses of everything that's happening. Um, so yeah, very, very happy to share with you this very, today's very positive, peaceful message. Lucy says hope, absolutely, absolutely. Because what we've been going through since the pandemic started has been like um, ascension interruptus or like not totally stopped or whatever, but just kind of like we had all of this energy and all of this momentum and all of this great stuff going and then kind of like kapow, smack down. And then everybody just kind of, um, you know, picked themselves up and now is kind of like putting together the shattered pieces and trying to rebuild the regular life. And I'm like, no, no, like we don't want to rebuild regular life. Like we want real ascension. It's just been quite a lot to try to get everybody back on track into the moment when you recognize ascension for the planet. And I talked about this last week is the good dream of the planet. Yes, our whole entire planet is ascending and our planet is leaving the bad dream, the nightmare of scarcity and the nightmare of rape and the nightmare of planetary invasion. That's our planet has been having a terrible dream. We are inhabitants of that dream. We are waking up from that bad dream too. That is what ascension is. And Trisha says it's cycling up and down the circuit physically in, in, in 
and on you. Interesting that you can really see that light moving through me. That's such beautiful reportage. Thank you for that, guys. I'm going to keep sharing my light with you no matter what. Yeah, Pedro says, today's serving of lasagna was great. Thank you, Aurora. You are so welcome. Pedro, I'm very honored, very honored for you to be in my class over so many years. You have seen me on my journey and watched my teachings evolve and you have a great mind and share so much with the class. So thank you for being here. I wanna say profound thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Lucy, if you guys don't know, Lucy, I know all the way from back in Woodstock and is the original publisher of my class when it was on DVDs, like actual DVDs before we had fast download speeds, believed in my work and validated me and encouraged me um, when no one knew about me and um, has been instrumental. Ah, uh, Lucy says, sweet. She says, you were glowing then too. It's very sweet. Thank you, my dear friend. Thank you. Yeah, so feel feel very pleased. She says, Aurora makes the best cow chips. Oh my God, I know this is totally non-serious, but maybe this is a fun thing. I just made some last night. I had to save some for my neighbors. My neighbors gave me a bunch of kale from their garden. I'm like, oh, I'm going to make cow chips. They're so good. I want to eat the whole thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so still making the cow chips after a brief respite, um, but they are quite amazing. If you want to know my recipe, it's kale rubbed with extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of sea salt, and my latest concoction involves um, on, uh, blanched almond flour. They sprinkle a little bit of that on top and it kind of gives it a little bit more crunch and body. And you can add garlic flakes or something like that if you want to. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. Profound respect, love, and gratitude to everyone who's in this class, because I also tell you about what it was like for me when I first walked in like 20 years ago, like I didn't know anyone and really didn't feel like I was connecting with anyone and felt like I had all of this information inside, didn't know how to share it, or who were the good people to share it with. And I'm always so genuinely pleased and gratified I feel like I have the most beautiful people here in my classes, um, connecting with me on YouTube and supporting my work on Patreon. Like everyone is super intelligent, super spiritually aware, has wonderful values, you know, is aligning with the things that I have to share for a very particular reason. I learn so much from you. I feel like very, very, um, you know, um, lucky that I've got such great people that I'm connected with. It just took me like 20 years to find you guys, but I knew that you were out there. So thank you for being with my life and being, being with me in my life and being with me parallel or, or with me on my journey. And uh, thank you for the reciprocal uplift and encouragement because I love to encourage you guys. So that's a much, much better thing to end a note to end on than my distress over the barking dog. Let me end the recording for right now. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.